comprehensive energy management in cities. Today, 50% of world population lives in cities, and this number keeps growing. Growing urbanization leads to overpopulation and growing energy and water needs, with the biggest problems linked to mobility and pollution. Successfully taking on these challenges are so-called smart cities. At Petrol, we promote the development of smart cities by collaborating and providing comprehensive, sustainable solutions. By understanding your needs, using our expertise and exploiting synergies, we optimally coordinate production and demand to actively and comprehensively manage energy and water. With our comprehensive solutions, you will save time and money and build an efficient city of the future. Petrol. Energy for life. Hello everyone and kindly welcome to the CTS The Lab Summit Mobility 2021. We are proud to share with you this year's main topic, vision of urban future. We are going to learn about the new opportunities in the field of mobility, look into many case studies from different industries and get to know smart solutions for the cities of the future. Even though we hoped we will be able to meet in person, this year's event is still happening virtually. Even though we are grateful that so many of you have registered, allowing our summit to make a big impact. Now it is time to get ready and take a deep dive into the latest trends in the field of mobility and other industries. Connect with the most important stakeholders in the field of smart cities, smart logistics and factories, smart cars and services and e-mobility. Future mobility is a mix of various industries which coexist and co-create the new experience in a sense of the future mobility. As I have already mentioned, the event is organized by two important organizations, Media House Delo and AV Living Lab, whose CEO and founder is joining me right now on our virtual stage. Welcome, Mr. Daniel Audagic. How are you today? Great. Excited? Yes, and so happy to be here again. Please, share something about you. Who are you? Yes, I am the CEO of AV Living Lab, uh, but also I am the elected member of Ljubljana City Council and the member of Slovenian National Digitalization Council. Tell me, Daniel, what is Summit about and what are the main topics this year? Yes, our Summit is bringing together uh, all stakeholders to discuss the future, urban future. And this will be discussed in two days in five panels. In first panel will be smart cities, second panel will be smart logistics and smart factories, and then third panel, smart car. And tomorrow we will talk about mobility as a service and e-mobility. Daniel, thank you very much. So let's start with vision of an urban future. And now the facts. 20 plus speakers from more than 10 countries, two days, more than seven hours of interesting and meaningful program and endless line of participants. Let's start with welcome speeches from distinguished guests and the first one to greet you is the Minister of Infrastructure of the Republic of Slovenia, Mr. Jerne Vrtovec, who will give the opening speech. Due to Slovenia protocol, the speech will be in Slovene with English subtitles. Mr. Vortovec, good morning and welcome to the City as a Lab Mobility 2021 Summit. Spoštovane odeleženke in odeleženci dogodka City as a Lab, mobilnost 2021. V čast in veselje mi je, da vas lahko nagovorim v vlogi ministra za infrastrukturo. Brez prometa bi si zelo težko predstavljali naša življenja. Saj povezujejo ljudi, mesta, kulture, države in celine. Pomemben je tako za družbo kot za gospodarstvo. 
in prispeva k bolj uravnoteženemu razvoju držav, ustvarjanju novih delovnih mest in tudi večji blagini za vse nas. Prometni sektor je eden od sektorjev, ki ga je pandemija COVID-19 najbolj prizadela. Zato bomo v času slovenskega predsedovanja Svetu Evropske unije na področju prometa sledili dvema glavnima ciljema – trajnosti in odpornosti. Promet igra eno od ključnih vlog za zagotovitev uspeha politike razogličanja. Evropska komisija si je namreč zadala cilj 90-odstotnega zmanjšanja izpusta toplogledih plinov v prometu do leta 2050. Za okrevanje gospodarstva in prometa bodo torej potrebne naložbe za nadaljni razvoj trajnostnega prometa ter za podporo javnemu potničkemu prometu in trajnostnim povezavam zlasti železniškim povezavam. Tega se zelo dobro zavedamo tudi na Ministrstvu za infrastrukturo. Letos imamo prvič v zgodovini v proračunu na voljo več kot milijardov evrov sredstev, kar je približno 200 milijonov evrov več kot lansko leto. Večina denarja bo namenjenega za prometno infrastrukturo, največ na področju železnic in sicer 509 milijonov evrov. Prizadevanja ministrstva so zato usmirjenja k razvoju prometa in prometne infrastrukture s poodbujanju ukrepov na področju trajnostne mobilnosti, vlaganjem v obnovljive vire energije ter čim bolj učinkovito rabo energije. Na Ministrstvu za infrastrukturo si želimo torej narediti korak naprej, tudi na področju digitalne mobilnosti. Zato bomo s premembami zakona o prevozih v cestnem prometu omogočili digitalizacijo taksi storitev in prihod platform, ki bodo zagotovile kakovostnejšo in enostavnejšo in dostopnejšo storitev taksi prevozov za vse. Želimo torej so ustvarjati moderno, digitalno in napredno Slovenijo, ki bo temeljila na zdravi konkurenci. Spoštovani, zavedam se, da bo za izpolnitev evropskih in mednarodnih obvez v prihodnje nujno potrebno dati večji povdarek na zmanjševanju potreb po vsakodnevni mobilnosti z ustreznim upravljanjem prostora in uporabo sodobnih tehnologij, ter v spostavitvi modernega železniškega omrežja in učinkovitega javnega potničkega prometa. Pri tem seveda ne smemo pozabiti na spodbujanje novih poslovnih modelov, ki temeljijo na digitalni tehnologiji, če bomo želeli zagotoviti trajnosten in konkurenčnejši sektor cestnega prometa. Thank you very much, Minister Vrtovec, for your encouraging thoughts. Next up, I would like to welcome the Mayor of Ljubljana, Mr. Zoran Jankovic. Good morning, Mr. Jankovic, and good morning, Ljubljana, the European green capital which shines brighter every year. Dobar dan, spoštovane gospe in gospode. Tu na vrhu Kristalne palače se vidi najlepše mesto na svetu. Letos v Ljubljani pripravljamo vizijo Ljubljane 2045 in pomeni del te vizije je poglavje o mobilnosti. Mobilnost za me pomeni, da najprej pripravljamo vso potrebno infrastrukturo in našo želje, da v tem obdobju povečamo našo pešč cono, ki je zdaj velika 12 hektarjev, za 100%. Imamo 300 km kolesarskih stez, imamo projekt Bicikel in tudi tu je naša želja, da bi te kolesarske steze povečali na 500 km, pri čemer se kolesari lahko vozijo tudi po pešč coni, pod pogojem dopuštevajo pešce kot prednostno kategorijo. Enako se vozijo po enosmenih ulicah pred avtomobili tam, ker imamo mitov 30 km na uro. Pomembna del tega je tudi naš javni prevoz. Do 2045 bomo imeli samo električne avtobuse in avtobuse na plin in tudi zelo pomembna panoga je tudi car share, ki ga bomo še pospeševali z električnimi vozili. Trdim, da je lahko Ljubljana po tem projektu mobilnosti vzor celotne Evropi. Ta trenutek imamo največjo peš cono v Evropi In s temi naši kavaljerji, ki omogočamo, da prihajajo od točke A do točke B brezplačeno, električni kavaljerji, smo tudi neko gledalo za vse naše obiskovalce, tako ljubljančane, kot tudi turiste, ko pride v centr mesta. Na koncu, mobilnost je pogavje, ki se 
ki se dejansko izraža vse vizije, kaj ti z urenjem mobilnosti, s hitrim prehodom iz točke A v točku B, bomo doseli, da bomo v Ljubljani imeli še bolj čist zrak. Ob tem so še drugi projekti. In naše ključno vprašanje, ali z vsemi točkami, se pravi javni pravoz, rumene linje, projekt bicikli se povečuje in pešč sone, ali bomo dosegli, da bojo naši prebivalci kupovali manj avtomobilov. Da avtomobil ne bo fetiš, ampak da se bo štilo avtomobilo zbanjšo za polovico. Srečno, draga Ljubljana. Thank you, Mr. Jankovic. We hope that Ljubljana will not only be the most beautiful city, but also the smartest one. Last year, I stressed that the world is on the crossroads of major changes. This year, I can add the, the vision of the future is clear. We are searching for the beauty of being. The world is working on achieving balanced living on all levels. Media must help the pursuit the goals, as they hold the key to awareness and acceptance of the new reality. In other words, the media's role is more important than ever. So, before we dig deeper into the discussion, we are honored to welcome among us the director of Media House Delo, Mr. Stojan Petric. Mr. Petric, welcome. Spoštovani, smo v času hitre rasti mobilnosti ljudi in stvari, predvsem zaradi naraščenja števila prebivalstva, njihova selitev v velika mesta, zahtev po spremembi odnosa do okolja in ekosistema, kar je izziv ekološke vzdržnosti v okviru Pariškega sporozuma in cilja, da je mobilnost izpust CO2 neutralna do leta 2050. Za dosega tega cilja ni zlatega metka ene tehnologije, ki bo rešila ta problem. Velikega vpliva digitalizacije, ki svojimi možnostmi omogoča povsem nove vidike in načine zvedbe mobilnosti. Zahtev po tehničnih kadrih, talentih, ki se bodo soočali z novimi rešitvami v mobilnosti. Vsa ta dejstva pelejo mobilnost v smeri tako imenovane multimodalne mobilnosti, razvijajo se rešitve, kot naprimer mobilnost kot storitev, pogonskih rešitev z uporabo energentov, ki minimalno ali ničeno vplivajo na okolje in tako dalje. Investicije, ki jih poleh električnih avtomobilov izvaja gospod Musk v satelitsko infrastrukturo za pridobivanje podatkov pri trženju mobilnosti kot obliko avtonomne vožnje, kaže na nove premike, ki se danes dogajajo. Kdo bo tehnološko podjetje? Proizvajalci avtomobilov takšnih ali drugačnih verjetno ne. Tehnološko podjetje na področju mobilnosti bo tisto, ki bo obladovalo podatke za avtonomno vožnjo. Kratkoročno v naslednjih desetih letih bo na področju pogonskega sklopa imeli evolucijski prehod na snovi izboljšenja vseh potrebnih sklopov. Izboljšenja učinkovitosti motorja z vnotrnim izgorevanjem do 50%, hibridizacija z 48-voltnimi hibridi in visoko napetostnimi hibridi ter baterijskimi pogoni in pogoni na gorevne celice vodik. Žal pa evolutivni pristop še zdaleč ne bo dovolj, če želimo, da gremo v smeri oglične nevtralnosti. Morali bomo uporabljati enega ključnih virov za mobilnost električno energijo, ki bo morala biti proizvedena iz obnovljivih virov. Torej, potreben je agresivn prehod na zelene nosilce energije, voda, sonce, veter, ki bodo osnova za zelene nosilce energije v različnih pojavnih oblikah – elektrika, vodik, zelena sintetična goriva, naprimer e-dizel, e-metan. Ti nosilce energije, vsi razen elektrike, delujejo kot skranjevalniki električne energije in tako predstavljajo tržno blago, kar omogoča generacijo zelenih virov na cenovno in energijsko optimalnih področjih. Zahteva pa to razvoj povsem novih tehnologij. Mešanje teh nosilcev v obstojiča fosilna goriva do 100% v bližnji prihodnosti nam bo kratkoročno reševalo problem obstojičih fuzil, na trgu istočasno pa vzpostavljalo infrastrukturo za dogročno vodikovo družbo. Za zaključek lahko zgostovosti rečem, 
da bo mobilnost v prihodnje zelo raznolika. Na eni strani zato, ker bodo možne rešitve ponele široki zbor za najoptimalnejšo rešitev, na drugi strani pa zradi niza novih tehnologij, ki se bodo v obdobi pred nami pojavljale, se bodo nekatere skazale za najučinkovitejše in bodo ostale med tem, ko bodo nekatere zginile. Spoštovani gledalci, verjamem, da vam bomo s pestrimi naborom govornikov in tematik konferencije, ki jo medijska hiša delo organizira v sodelovanju z družbo AV Living Lab, odgovorili na vso rebitno vprašanja, ki se vam bodo porajala. Srečno. The time for co-creating new and better future is now. Mr. Petrič from Media House Delo, thank you very much. Cities around the world are facing rapid urbanization. For example, in 1950, 740 million people were living in the cities, while today the number of people living in cities raised up to the more than 4 billion. Cities are facing various phases of change, development and evolution. Today, we will focus on sustainable cities, green cities, the cities of the future, intelligent cities, and where we, human beings, actually play the most important role. Joining me back on stage is Mr. Daniel Audagic. Hello, Daniel, again. Hello. The title of the first panel is What are the challenges of the cities in the future? We know that cities and settlements are under increasing pressure. How can they ensure a higher quality in cities? How can cities attract or retain residents in cities? Compete with other cities and how to ensure the sustainable use of resources, space, infrastructure and their services? Daniel, can you please share with us your insight about this next panel? Yes, of course. Next panel will be very inspiring. We will have trend-setting companies and cities talking about future services, future needs, because we know that cities will need to manage infrastructure, space, and resources better. Because, like you mentioned earlier, we are facing rapid urbanization. And just maybe two facts, back in the 50s we had only two mega cities, which were Tokyo and New York, and today we have more than 30 and growing. Which means that today we will hear company patrol and Airbus urban air mobility that will talk about uh, how to manage better resources, what are new mobility options, and how to create services for digital era. And then also we will have two cities, the Neum city and Toyota Wuhan city, who are cities of the future, and who will say how citizens will live in urban future, what is also a theme of our to uh, this year's event. Daniel, once again, thank you very much. It sounds very interesting, mm -hmm. so let's start it. Yes. Now let's listen to our amazing speakers and their thoughts on the subject. But before we jump into the best practices and lessons learned, I would like to use this opportunity to once again thank all these amazing brands who are supporting us. As you know, in order to share the knowledge and have the highest possible impact, this conference is free of charge. This would not be possible with our amazing sponsors. I'd like to thank our generous sponsor, company Petrol, for supporting us. Petrol is the largest energy company in the region, a one-stop shop helping develop cities and local communities, the public sector, industry and small and large businesses. With a wide range of cost-efficient and environmentally friendly top business solutions, they want to become an integrated energy transition partner, ensuring an excellent user experience. Petrol will be represented by Mr. André Bergant, who began his career as a mechanical engineer in the field of motoring and mobility, operating in Slovenia and the wider region. He expanded his expertise in several companies where he oversaw the development and strategic planning. At Petrol, he is currently the Director of Energy and Environmental Systems. Mr. Andrei Bergant, welcome. 
Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's my great pleasure today to share with you uh, a few facts and notes of what we are at Petrol Group uh, doing uh, today and especially for the future. As you know, we are all living in a very challenging time and we stand at the entrance of a very, I would say, unpredictable future. So there might be different solutions, there might be crossroads, but uh, it's always a matter of the decision we take. And we at Petrol Company, we have decided to uh, provoke a little bit because we have been for more than seven decades uh, a leading Slovenian and regional oil company. We actually have been supplying uh, fossil fuels, uh, petroleum products uh, to our customers and clients. And uh, from that point of view, we are really how, how would I say, a black, black company. So now we are actually in the position to lead uh, not just ourselves as the group of more than 5,000 people, but uh, also the region we are living in, into green future. And uh, it's going to be challenging, because uh, in any case, uh, the petrol and the gas uh, is still here, is still present, and uh, we need to meet the demand uh, of our clients. And this is what actually we are going to continue. But at the same time, we are very determined to build up or to put together the bricks into the green future. Today, we are, as I said, uh, really a leading Slovenian petrol company, um, having many gas stations, not just in Slovenia, also in, in southeastern region. And so this is what customer needs today. Uh, but in the future, we have other products to offer. And we are completely aware how to do it today. So being number one is not just uh, being happy of that. It's also the responsibility we have uh, to lead the change. And this is the change which will not be easy. It's not going to be um, very well determined. So we, we have to choose... Uh, Careful, carefully what, uh, in which direction to go. So we have decided to uh, put the team together to invite many engineers and uh, to develop products which will lead us to this green future. And uh, our, our determination is also shown by the investment we are planning to do. So in the next period of five years, we are planning to invest almost 700 million euro into companies' transition. And 35% of total 700 million will be invested into energy transition. So it's roughly 250 million. Uh, some might say, might say it's not a lot, but still being in the transition period, uh, we believe this is uh, what we have to do and we are going to do. Um, we we developed several areas of uh, this transition, several products, uh, depending on either we are on the side of uh, trying to decrease the energy consumption or to develop products to produce, to produce green energy, so to say. So we, have, uh, we are going to build our future on four pillars besides the oil business, which, are going to, which is going to uh, decrease in the next, I would say, a decade. So we have one pillar which is uh, directly connected with uh, uh, how to spare energy, how to make our daily living more energy efficient. So we have products uh, meant for industries, for end customers, where we actually try to decrease the consumption, to make their processes uh, more efficient. We develop the e-mobility, not just e-mobility, also the mobility in total. We are thinking about, we are building uh, the public infrastructure of e-charging stations. We are also taking care of uh, fleet management and combining all those things in one big, big package. We are also investing, investing into uh, renewable power plants. Uh, we are happy that we already have uh, one wind power plant in Croatia, one just about to be open. It's not just about wind, it's also about solar, it's also about some new technologies like hydrogen. 
And the last but not least, uh, we have to put all those or the, bring all those points together. So we also developed our own uh, platform, IT platform, that we can manage all those uh, energy uh, challenges we have. I will talk about this in details uh, in the next few minutes. So when we talk about improving energy efficiency, it's about developing products with our engineers to help industries, to help uh, end users, to decrease their daily energy consumption, because this is one part of the equation. And uh, we have developed products where we uh, try to control the, the water consumption. So there are almost 11,000 kilometers of water system in Slovenia, and there are estimated a huge amount of water which is some, some kind lost in the process. So, so our system helps our customer to decrease these losses. And with that, we of course take care of our water supply, so to say. We are investing into uh, new public uh, energy efficient lighting. Uh, Slovenia is mostly covered already with this, so we have up-to-date lighting public systems, but there is a lot of opportunity uh, in the southern and eastern Europe, in Croatia and in Serbia, where we are also very active today. Um, the second area, the second pillar we are developing is, as I mentioned before, uh, renewables. So there are actually three major areas. One, are, one is uh, wind uh, power uh, plants, the second, solar power plants, and also we are developing in this segment the hydrogen technology. This is a brand new one. People don't know exactly in which direction we are going, but there are, there are already needs in the market uh, how to actually bring hydrogen into the, into the system. Uh, we are happy to announce that not just one power plant, which is in operation today in Croatia, we are just about to open another one in June. Altogether, there will be more than 50 megawatts of energy. And we are also just in the process of developing our first solar plant, uh, power plant, which will be probably open next, next year. Uh, we are also very active in... Uh, using the funds of European Commission and working on different pilot projects. And one pilot project which is uh, in the middle of development is in Luce. So it's how to bring and make a community independent. And this community is now independent from, let's say, the, uh, how, how they say, the uh, black energy sources. So the community is completely self-efficient with renewables mostly with solar, solar panels and uh, batteries, so they can, in case of uh, uh, any disruption in the supply of the energy, they can actually survive for a couple of days just by themselves. In uh, mobility area, we are the mobility provider, so actually today we are still supplying many gas stations with gasoline. Uh, we are completely aware that this is not uh, the way the future will look like, but the demand in the market exists, so we are committed to develop the best possible fuels uh, to keep the nature as clean as possible. But in the meantime, the main focus is immobility. We are building the public infrastructure, uh, not just in Slovenia, also in Croatia, and we plan to have more than 1,600 uh, charging points uh, at the end of 2025. And in the meantime, we are also developing products in, in the area of um, fleet management because we believe in the future we will not just talk about ownership of the cars uh, by individuals. There will be probably different products uh, enabling um, us the mobility. And to put all those dots, all these dots together, we believe there is a platform needed, and we have developed a unique, we call it Tango platform, which combines all those energy systems and enables not just ourselves, but also our customers uh, to control their energy consumptions and, and their processes. So, at the end of this short presentation, I think in this process of changes, we are already in 
we cannot walk alone. So being number one, as I said, is the responsibility um, to make this change, to lead the change. It's not just about us. Uh, it's about the understanding of the future. It's about combining different partners together, like governments, like big enterprises, and also individuals in this transition to a better and green future. Thank you. Thank you. As you heard, Mr. Bergant mentioned that there is no smart city without sustainable solutions. Energy efficiency, the use of renewable energy and efficient energy management are crucial part of every smart city. This subject has an even more important role when it comes to facing global climate change and the trend towards the green recovery of the economy. I wonder, what does Mr. Florian Linnert, Head of Urban Development and Mobility of company NEOMS, think of this topic? Before joining NEOM, Florian Linnert was the founder and CEO at Future Lab Berlin, a sustainable innovation think tank and investment advisory firm focusing on sustainable innovation, urban tech and future mobility. Mr. Florian Linnert also serves as a chair of the European Commission Expert Group for Smart Mobility Systems and Services and is a member of the EU Commission Expert Assembly on Smart and Sustainable Cities. Hearing the thoughts will surely have a big impact. Mr. Linnert, we are ready. Welcome. Thank you very much, Peter, for the kind introduction, and it's a great pleasure um, to address um, the uh, Living Lab Summit. Um, I'd like to share with you and um, the participants today um, just a few insights about NEOM and the vision that we have for becoming um, a global living lab for the future of mobility. NEOM is really a, a very unique project, um, a greenfield development in the northwestern uh, corner of Saudi Arabia, the um, overall size of NEOM is actually 26,000 square kilometers, um, approximately the size of Belgium. Um, and over the last um, a couple of years, um, we have developed um, a, a very iconic um, new regional plan and urban development plan of how we want to develop this new um, uh, land of the future. And of course, with regard to um, the interrelationship between cities and mobility, city shaped mobility and mobility shaped cities, and is how we bring together land use, urban design, and sustainable technology is really um, how we will um, create the mobility system of the future. And of course, NEOM has developed a very iconic land use plan. We're planning to build a linear city that cuts to um, the, um, the area that um, uh, uh, NEOM occupies. And you can see on the map behind me, um, it sits um, uh, between the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, um, uh, and, and features both very high mountain ranges and incredible desert landscape. The vision that we have is to build the line. Um, and a linear city that um, um, extends from the coast through our mountains into our desert plains, and that will um, allow us to develop a very unique approach to, to urban design and, and mobility. Um, and of course, it is that combination um, of um, these different um, elements that determines um, the mobility system. And our mobility vision is really underpinned um, by a vision and the number of principles. We want to be truly sustainable, um, implement shared mobility, lead in innovation and autonomy, but also integrate intelligent land use, urban design and technology. And the four principles that we seek to implement is a fully zero emissions um, mobility system, um, building on a 100% renewable energy system that we're building out based on sun and wind, and we have the ideal conditions for it. Um, we want to focus on um, core public transit systems and shared mobility, um, really overcoming the private car um, that has caused so many problems in the cities in the 20th century. We want to be able to offer on-demand, just-in-time, and um, enabled by autonomous services um, uh, mobility. And, and also, we have a very strong focus that in our cities and our neighborhoods, we really want to um, emphasize active mobility and micro-mobility um, as a contribution to livable cities. 
and um, in doing so, and in building out our infrastructure, and then designing um, our overarching urban um, system and mobility system, we also want to be a global living lab. We want to work with partners from around the world, bring together best practice from around the world um, in bringing together a multimodal, fully integrated, um, uh, sustainable mobility system. Um, just to perhaps um, to um, give you a bit of background, this shows you where Neom sits in the world. And of course, the line is also symbolic. If you see the line on the screen here, it really um, is a line that will show where the economic center, uh, as the center of economic gravity of the world will develop in the next decades. Um, and of course, Neom sits quite strategically um, between a number of key continents and in the middle um, of these um, and has access um, to all of them. Um, similarly, when we look at um, uh, the sea mobility, um, Neom is situated right at, um, uh, next to one of the most important shipping corridors of the world um, through the Suez Canal, um, uh, about 25% of global uh, uh, shipping flows uh, uh, and trade flows come through here. And one of the key um, objectives for Neom is, is to develop one of the most advanced ports um, that will be fully automated and that will serve essentially as the key logistics hub to supplying, supplying Neom. It also enables um, uh, uh, the access of potentially building a land bridge over um, to um, uh, across the Arabian Peninsula and thereby cutting short um, the journeys of ships that will otherwise have to go all the way around. Um, and, um, and that's part of uh, Neom's sea mobility strategy. In terms of land mobility, of course, we were also um, sitting really at the hub of some of the most important population centers. Um, and a key vision in the long term for Neom is to bring together the continents of China, the Middle East and North Africa and Southern Europe um, and to provide new connections and new um, uh, relationships and trade flows um, between these. Now, in designing our mobility system, um, we really looked at how we can tailor that for each scale. Um, each of the, the regional, the, the urban and the neighborhood scale require their own specific mobility solutions that we have to bring together and integrate into a, uh, a fully um, multimodal system. And our mobility system is essentially deeply anchored and has evolved, co-evolved with our land use regional plan. You can see here the, the Neom territory and where our linear city, the line will be built, symbolically extending that line that I showed earlier. Um, and, um, and also um, uh, a number of other developments, smaller, low density developments that we are um, uh, implementing. Um, around Neom and mountain resorts, resorts along our coast, um, but also our port in the south and a new international airport in the east, as well as um, uh, an archipelago of islands um, that are really sitting in one of the most untouched coral seas. Um, Neom has an incredible range of terrains and, and ecosystems. And one of the key ambitions that we had when we developed this regional plan was to think about how we can organize urbanization in the 21st century um, um, with as little footprint on the land, um, with an ability for our urban system to grow for future population growth. And that's really what the line represents. Um, now, in terms of the mobility system um, to then service this um, uh, regional plan and land use plan, we have a number of key features. Um, one of them is, of course, to um, uh, have access to an international airport, as well as an international seaport, um, as well as then providing core backbone public and freight transit systems that can really take the heavy lifting in terms of moving people and goods. Um, secondly, at the regional level, we want to innovate around um, EV trails, around air mobility, electric air mobility, that allows us to connect our core urban development area to our outlying settlements, low density settlements, and really unlock a very unique use case for um, uh, electric air mobility, which is that we can reinvent mobility without infrastructure, without ground infrastructure. Um, and because we want to protect 95% of NEOM um, and leave it undeveloped because of its really incredible natural beauty, um, we also want to find ways to provide transport connectivity without having to build roads everywhere and um, with all the um, negative uh, environmental externalities of, of road-based transport. Um, and so our aim is really to innovate and to be leading in integrating electric air mobility into our multimodal transport system. 
And lastly, at the regional level, we also want to innovate around implementing um, emission-free coastal shipping, looking at both things such as electric autonomous container barges, but also, of course, all kinds of passenger vessels, be they battery electric um, or fuel cell driven or alternative fuel driven, um, to be able to connect through this wonderful um, marine um, environment that we have in our islands. Um, if we then look at the modes that we're developing, we're focusing very much in high, ultra high speed passenger transit, um, looking both at the latest generation of um, uh, high speed rail, but also exploring the potential to future development of Hyperloop. We're looking at the latest generation of electric freight rail and autonomous freight rail to provide the heavy lifting for our logistics services and very much um, the EV tolls and the um, uh, coastal modes that um, I had just described. Now, of course, um, in order to unlock this seamless multimodal system um, that allows you to switch between these modes, we also need to build out the right mobility hubs that connect um, across these different modes and allow people um, uh, uh, easy switching from one mode to the next. Now, at the urban level, the, you can really um, uh, show how the, the line as an urban design unlocks an incredible opportunity to rethink the city without the car. This is a bird's eye section of the line, and you can see the line is relatively narrow. At the heart of it, we have an integrated transport and infrastructure and utility backbone, um, which we call the spine, as the human body has a spine. Um, and that means that um, given the dimensions of the line, you can then develop um, urban neighborhoods represented by the circles here, which really have that perfect dimension um, in terms of density and accessibility to a core public transit um, system, and then allows you to rethink the city and those neighborhoods um, in terms of not actually requiring cars because you have such short distances to your central transport system. And that then allows us to both focus um, on, on some shared electric and autonomous mobility to complement that local um, delivery, but also to look at autonomous um, electric freight um, first last mile distribution um, within that urban system. And at the neighborhood level, what we're looking at is really um, um, unlocking a, a very high mode share, perhaps 70, 80% of active mobility, walking and cycling um, to uh, um, free up the city um, from all these cars um, and, the, um, and, and create livable spaces for people to, to, to enjoy, um, but also to innovate around how we can solve for the, the other big issue that we have at the moment in the world in terms of um, uh, uh, delivery, goods delivery, um, by innovating around potential modes. And so really in summary, we're looking at um, integrating a whole range of modes, each of them um, serving their purpose at the right level, um, the regional, the urban, and the neighborhood, um, each solving um, for creating the most livable city and at the same time, the most efficient on-demand um, uh, mobility system um, that we can create. Um, and, and this is really the heart of the integrated mobility system that we're planning. Now, of course, apart from the vehicular solutions, this requires um, a number of um, enablers. Um, you need to have the right services, architecture. How do we um, um, provide and provide for the just-in-time um, disposition of fleets um, to reach our users? Um, we need to um, obviously look at the energy system integration. We need to look at um, the required ICT infrastructure. And of course, we need to look at um, um, the right governance and regulatory um, system to allow for that um, a shared mobility um, uh, 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 system. Now, with services, we think autonomy is a great enabler. It can help solve problems. Um, of course, autonomy on its own is not um, an objective. Even if we turn every car in the world uh, autonomous today, we wouldn't have solved a single problem. So we need to understand where can autonomy actually help solve a problem. And in particular, with shared mobility, there's an opportunity to look at um, the demand-driven real-time disposition of fleets um, that then enables shared and on-demand mobility. But of course, we also need to be able to connect the user to the vehicle and to the infrastructure in um, a seamless way to enable that. Um, and that is true not just for passengers, but also for our logistic flows, where we want to have a just-in-time and fully automated um, logistics infrastructure. Now, for energy, we, we have uh, the incredible situation in Neon where we have the perfect balance of sun and wind so that we can create a 100% renewable energy system and actually also um, look at desalinating 
um, water is a big problem with um, green power, and then actually also unlocking um, a green hydrogen ecosystem um, that, could, that is important for industrial applications and for some heavy um, uh, uh, mobility needs. So we're looking at both BEV and fuel cell. Of course, we need to then build out the requisite charging infrastructure, inductive, conductive, and perhaps um, even in motion. And we need to look at um, really the distributed integration of our electric vehicles into our smart grid. Um, and equally, and this is the benefit that we have across all of this being a green field, we can really look at customizing our infrastructure to enable a ubiquitous data collection um, uh, that then can underpin these services, have an integrated systems architecture, um, as well as then developing the requisite platforms that we need um, to manage and connect um, the passenger mobility logistics, but also city services. Um, and um, lastly, of course, we have an incredible opportunity to, to innovate and build on best practice around the world in terms of how we design an urban and regional mobility authority that can govern mobility as a service, that can govern city services, um, and can integrate a whole range of mo mobility service providers into one um, uh, uh, homogenous or, or integrated system, um, and also, of course, um, help us to um, manage the efficiency of operations. Um, so this is a, a quick overview um, of, of NEOM's mobility system and our plans for mobility and NEOM as a whole. Perhaps to just finish off, um, as we build out our steady state infrastructure, what would a customer journey look like? Um, you would be arriving and probably pre-book your, your trip to NEOM, um, uh, arrive on NEOM's airline, um, experience a seamless clearance um, uh, at our airport, um, travel with the high-speed system to your uh, next mo uh, mobility hub, and then perhaps take one of our electric sea shuttles um, to one of our beautiful island locations. Um, and similarly, if we look at um, the, the same for freight, um, we would have cargo arriving um, uh, by sea, would have a fully automated um, port process, a reshuffling into our um, uh, uh, high-speed tr uh, freight transit, um, and then further distribution um, along um, NEOM and um, also to some of the other settlements. We're even looking at next generation uh, hydrogen uh, fuel cells, freight airships to access our remote that mountain region. Um, and of course, last mile distribution by a number of um, both ground-based and um, uh, air mobility um, uh, devices. So I think this gives you um, a very quick overview of um, NEOM and of the vision that we have to become a global living lab for the future of mobility. Thank you very much for your attention and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Now it's time to hear how companies like aerospace company Airbus see their role in the new coming urban air mobility and how they are making it a reality. With us today is also Mr. Vasilias Algoridas. He is leading the EU public co-creation and ecosystem outreach activities at Airbus Urban Mobility. Mr. Algoridas will present the activities and achievements of the Urban Air Mobility Cities Initiative, which are proudly led by Airbus. Mr. Algoridas will also touch on the subject of urban air mobility itself from the local and mobility authorities' points of view. Mr. Algoridas, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the latest experience uh, from the Urban Air Mobility Initiative Cities Community, or UIC2. Uh, we have been here on this uh, stage uh, in the 2020 version um, of this uh, Mobility Summit, and I would like to share um, some of the work of the Cities Initiative over the last um, months. Uh, the title of the presentation is about uh, driving the sustainable transition of urban mobility to the third dimension. Uh, we are in, uh, in a panel uh, about cities, uh, smart cities, talking about mobility, urban air mobility, but the point actually is about urban mobility. Uh, the initiative, uh, if you may recall, uh, or for the ones who don't know, uh, is uh, part of the EU's uh, smart cities marketplace, and part of the Sustainable uh, Urban Mobility Cluster. Uh, in fact, uh, it is a community of uh, cities, it's the voice of the cities and regions, 
Uh, there are 46 cities uh, today, and this is growing. It is changing around 15 countries uh, in Europe. The whole idea is that uh, cities take uh, the lead uh, in order to define uh, projects and demonstrators that could uh, influence um, policy on sustainable urban mobility and uh, projects they develop uh, so we can have bottom-up uh, information about uh, what the policy should be and what could be potential uh, uses. So it is purely city-centric and citizen-driven approach. And the different projects and policy work that the cities and regions are doing, uh, exploring the interfaces of urban air mobility with public transport, if we're talking about passenger transportation or with uh, logistics platforms, if it is about cargo or emergency uh, systems and services, when we're talking uh, on uh, medical and emergency oriented uh, use cases. It's also about mobility as a service, or in the case of logistic or uh, health, about health as a service or logistic as a service. What could be the role of drones and urban air mobility more general towards these um, services uh, in a smart city environment? Here, uh, an important element that uh, comes is the interaction, the interfaces, uh, of UEM and the UEM infrastructure with the ground infrastructure required, not only for UEM, but for the wider mobility and how perhaps we can uh, save in terms of infrastructure investments by um, identifying early on uh, synergies in terms of infrastructure development. The only, I would say, pure element that relates to aviation is air traffic management or a UTM, unmanned traffic management or urban traffic management uh, concepts. And the point here is that uh, the cities uh, provide uh, bottom-up information uh, to the regulators through the experiences they gain through the projects. And at the same time, we have top-down a uh, cascade of the regulatory frameworks that have been developed in order for the cities and regions to better understand uh, how they have to prepare themselves. So it is really an iterative process in terms of uh, policy making. Uh, at this stage, I would like to give a definition of urban air mobility as there are a lot of terms uh, around. And I think each term has um, a different perspective in depending on uh, what, where, where is, I would say, the community it is coming from. So here uh, you may have heard urban, regional, advanced air mobility, is it suburban, is it really urban? So the, I think there is a, a sort of confusion. I, I would like to share with you a definition that originates from the community of the cities. So it is uh, representing how cities perceive urban air mobility. And the first thing we have to clarify is that we don't take the term urban literally what it means in terms of mobility, but we use it uh, rather as a semantic. A semantic to indicate very low altitude air traffic over populated areas at scale. So this is what urban is about, at least from the perspective of the cities. And here you see uh, that the term UAM, it is, not, it is not restricted to the actual type of air traffic. Uh, what it is the different vehicles, where we see that in many cases, uh, if we talk for regional air mobility or urban air mobility, sometimes we take um, as a consideration for this definition, the actual vehicles we take. In this case, what is important as a citizen, as a city, is you have a new type of air traffic. And this is very low altitude air traffic. It is not potential air traffic up to the sky when some planes, commercial planes fly. And you can say, yes, but this is already happening. We have helicopters. But what uh, technologies of distributed electric propulsion and uh, digitalization of the uh, urban um, traffic, manage air traffic management system is about is, is that they can they enable and allow for this type of air traffic to take place at scale. And this is, I think, the key word where it distinguishes urban air mobility for other types of, say, air mobility over a city that we have already today. It is this scale that, in fact, 
creates uh, a number of challenges and opportunities. So we can see UN projects, for example, that are taking place with um, port uh, authorities or with cities, uh, like in Hamburg, where we have use cases that are focused on uh, time and mission critical uh, situations, where the focus is more than being safe and secure, but also explore how we can have regular operations of this, because the ultimate aim, it is not to have a demonstration for the sake of a technology demonstration, but to really work and understand what do we need to do in order to establish a public service. This is another example of uh, a UN projects that um, are focusing more on linking airports uh, uh, and cities. It's an example from the uh, city of uh, Aachen and the wider region of uh, the cross-border region of uh, Machel. This is Maastricht, Aachen, uh, Herren, Hasselt and Liège. And um, the real aim here it is not just the development of some technology that it has been developed in that region, but really to explore region, but really to explore how can we enable a quickly or even in cases, not just a matter only of being um, uh, faster, but to give accessibility to certain uh, cities and regions to key hubs of mobility like airports. One of the key aspects here is that the air aspect here, the third dimension, it has to be linked uh, to the existing systems of mobility. So intermodality, it is key here. Uh, and this is aligned with the wider, I would say, European approach uh, towards uh, integrated sustainable mobility. Uh, and this is manifested in the best way, uh, as we know, through the concept of mobility as a service. A lot of work already is happening there to digitalize the, the connections of the different uh, mobility services, but also to align them in order to improve the service we can provide. So we can provide a seamless uh, passenger experience and journey because this is the ultimate aim. What we observe is that the third dimension is actually missing there. There is some initial work there, but if we want to realize the truly the true potential of mass, the third dimension needs to be integrated there. And it's not only the passenger, uh, passenger aspect, this includes also the potential logistics or cargo opportunities that um, uh, are uh, having opportunity to be realized and optimized uh, through mass. So from this discussion, what I want to highlight is that there is an imperative for uh, integrating the, um, the traffic of air and ground. This is not really the case today. Um, what we see, for example, in aviation is there is a lot of work and significant work towards integrated airspace. And this is not an easy task. It is about, in fact, moving from the analog systems where today, uh, by capitalizing on the digitalized versions, to an integrated airspace. And uh, this will mean that all the flying objects will be under the same traffic regime. Uh, today, we are on the left side. The target is to go to the right side. And what we see there is that air traffic over cities, it is an integrated part of the overall air traffic. And for the aviation sector to achieve this, uh, a lot of projects and uh, regulatory uh, works uh, have been in place in order for this to be uh, to take place in a safe and secure manner. For example, where are we going to establish the so-called air corridors over a city? And uh, regulators like EASA, they have been working a lot to create different versions uh, and um, I would say varieties of uh, regulatory frameworks in order to ensure the safe and secure uh, use uh, of this technology. However, here we have to acknowledge that the urban aspect implies more than the increased levels of safety and security that are required. Here it's about, in fact, the, um, the point that uh, it's about involving cities and a wide spectrum of stakeholders. And cities already, they have legitimate reasons why they are important in this discussion and what this urban flair brings.
uh, because in many cases they own and orchestrate the transportation, they even control the transport data, and they have invested themselves uh, in the digital infrastructure of the wider smart city. So what we see here is that cities are more than just the potential future customers or users of UM solutions. They are partners, and for sure, as we see, uh, as the time evolves, they're becoming more and more central actors towards the social embracement. So urban traffic, in fact, sets a number of opportunities and challenges. Uh, we see uh, in this graph, which is from the city of Hamburg, uh, I think it's a good representation of, of what are the stakes here. When we're talking about urban air mobility, we're talking about this low level altitude air traffic, where we see that the air vehicles, in many cases may fly lower than uh, the highest uh, buildings in the city. This is very different from the other type of air traffic we can see with the commercial airplanes, where they really fly uh, at the high altitude and typically far away from a city in an airport. Of course, there are airports that are close to a city, but in most cases, um, we try to have airports a bit far away from the city. So here, the challenges and opportunities are coming from improving safety and security, as we have seen from airspace digitalization. But this, at the same time, brings opportunities on what we can do with that. Uh, key aspects here is the new infrastructure and the interfaces required, as we introduced earlier, earlier on, between the aviation and mobility infrastructure, the new business and services that will emerge either by optimizing the existing ones or by having a birth of totally new ones. And, and one of the key challenges here is how can we uh, adapt a new mindset for policy and regulatory approaches that actually can embrace the pace uh, of the emerging technologies and the innovation. And this is where it is important that the cities, as we said before, become a partner and the importance of um, having uh, dynamic living labs that can be, in fact, um, actors uh, for uh, influencing policy making in a rather dynamic manner. So the urban traffic sets new perspectives for industry, new economic uh, spaces above cities, and more general new perspectives for mobility. So it's about a totally new status quo. And this new status quo offers uh, cities new opportunities, but at the same time, uh, new tasks and responsibilities for them. We have seen different examples of opportunities. So at the same time, the cities, as they are a layer of government closest to, to the um, uh, citizens, uh, we can understand that they are an essential partner in having a deciding role about how this urban airspace uh, shall be governed. It is not just national airspace. It's about, and this is uh, how the city see it, as an expansion of a public space. And this is where uh, ongoing debate and challenges, in fact, are taking place in terms of the regulatory frameworks uh, around the globe. Uh, the cities of the UM initiative have responded to this challenge by issuing uh, in December 2020, as part of the Amsterdam Drone Week, the manifesto on the multi-level governance of the urban sky. Uh, you can find more details about it um, if you visit uh, this website, where the cities list uh, five points that need to be considered in terms of what could be the role uh, of cities and regions. Uh, this manifesto has been already supported by 26 uh, cities and regions across Europe, and more cities uh, are joining. Uh, this will be uh, open for support until uh, end of November, when we'll, we will present again during the Drone Week 2021 uh, all the communities that have uh, supported um, uh, this uh, work. The influence of the manifesto has been uh, um, quite um, uh, impactful and acknowledged by us and the European Commission, as on the recent Article 18, of um, the um, um, use space implementing a regulation that has been approved uh, in, in April, we can see that um, it is acknowledged explicitly the need to establish a mechanism 
to coordinate with authorities, including at local level. And this including at a local level, it is what um, gives the importance of the cities and the regions and where the manifesto has uh, been uh, quite instrumental. We're talking here about the mechanism and uh, this is in fact what the whole UIC2 uh, is about. It's about uh, putting cities and regions in the driving seat. It is about um, UIC2 serving as a city-centric platform where we can all the different stakeholders ensure a holistic approach to urban mobility. And here there are some prerequisites that apply to urban and sustainable mobility. It's about co-creating, a platform for co-creating with the many different actors, including the citizens, and also having a particular focus on proactively engaging with citizens. And the UM initiative, the UIC2, the cities of the UIC2 have been doing that through the task forces that try to address um, the different um, uh, pillars, I would say, of the UM initiative, uh, as you see through the different colors. Uh, the task forces and the UIC2 uh, has already some important uh, key achievements and ongoing activities, uh, whether the recent work uh, completed with the European Investment Bank on uh, a process roadmap uh, that relates to how we could finance uh, UM projects um, that uh, are in the context of a city or a regional development, ongoing funding on Horizon 2020 dedicated on UEM, uh, then we have uh, standalone uh, dedicated UM funding in different nations. Uh, we have um, the European Space Agency funding uh, on UEM. The U Space Regulatory Framework I have just mentioned to you. Ongoing work with DG Home uh, in terms of a handbook uh, for counter non collaborative uh, UAS. Uh, there has been um, in March a uh, publication on drones from OECD ITF where the USC2 has contributed. There is ongoing work with Digimove on the practitioner's uh, guide on the sustainable urban mobility plan, specifically for UAM. And of course, the USC2 collaborates with all the main uh, networks and uh, communities and projects in mobility like POLIS, Ertico ITS, Europe, UATP, and the EIT Urban Mobility. So yes, as we can see from here, it is about more than an emerging market. Uh, UM, uh, it is about a business ecosystem, but it is more than that. It is all about a social business ecosystem. So as I often say, it is not about what the technology can do for us, but what we want the technology to do for us. This applies to, in any case of technology, um, and I believe in case of UM, it is even um, uh, more important and even more, I would say, predominantly uh, manifest. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Um, I'm happy to have the opportunity to discuss further this um, in, during the panel. Thank you very much. Mr. Algoridas, thank you for your time, for being with us, and for your insights on the topic. Wow, I'm sure that just like me, our audience has many questions. Dear audience, coming up next is our roundtable, which will focus on what are the challenges of the cities of the future. Please feel free to post all your thoughts and questions in the chat. This is a great opportunity to interact with our speakers and get their insights. Our moderator, Mr. Daniel Audagic, will explain the house rules. Let's find out the answers and solutions to the challenges of the cities of the future, together. Hello. And this is how live events are. Sometimes also, you know, technical difficulties occur, but we will manage that. So now we are starting with Roundtable Smart Cities. And with me are uh, Mr. Ewald Krančevic, the Director of Sales of Energy and Solutions at Company Pro, Mr. Vasilis Argolidas, the Head of EU Public Co-Creation and Ecosystem Outreach at Airbus, and Mr. Florian Leonard, uh, the head of urban development and mobility at Milan. So, 
as uh, Mr. Bergan from Petrol already mentioned earlier, there are no new smart cities without a sustainable solution. And when it comes to sustainability, one of the main challenges of European cities is the adoption of existing cities and infrastructure, especially for the energy consumption point of view. So, Mr. Kranchevi, how is the company Petrol tackling those challenges? And what are the best practices, especially in the area of circular economy or sustainable reconstruction and adoption? Uh, thank you, Daniel, for this question. Uh, so we at Petrol, we are aware of the importance of energy efficiency in cities. Um, as we know, city stakeholders are facing few common challenges. Uh, cost management on, on, on one side, running the city infrastructure with limited personnel, um, then ensuring this user-friendly services and uh, at the end, uh, creating a highly responsive and sustainable city. Uh, from our point of view, from our perspective, uh, sustainable city infrastructure is of vital importance in smart cities. So it can be further improved through very different energy efficiency measures and management, and management, of course. And on top of that, we are trying to use as much as possible of renewable energy sources. Uh, so when we are talking about city infrastructure, uh, we are giving special emphasis on the buildings, on energy efficiency buildings. Uh, we know that such buildings are using uh, up to 40% of energy and costs generally speaking, about 35% of carbon uh, uh, emissions. Uh, so um, our solutions uh, include energy retrofit, uh, PV installations, uh, geo geothermal uh, uh, energy solutions, heating and cooling, uh, ventilation, smart lighting, and uh, at top of that also sustainable uh, mobility. Uh, charging infrastructure and uh, and e-mobility services, vehicles, and so on. Um, so, we, if I mention only a few projects uh, where we try it and, and, and to help uh, our customers, uh, so we develop several of them, and and, and most of them also include uh, renewables. Um, just to mention a few, Mega M, a complete solution for office building renovation where we implement uh, PV, uh, PV uh, on the roof and then we use this green electricity for running uh, uh, electricity consumers in the building. So heating, cooling, ventilation uh, and also charging stations for, for EV. Uh, another example is a, a sports facility, squash land. So we made a, a complete uh, uh, energy solution. Uh, so so, uh, solar power plant, uh, geothermal energy, heating, cooling, e-mobility, efficient indoor and outdoor lighting. Um, and we also use the old material, so we recycle uh, the, the old squash land and use those materials in, 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 in the new ones. So, so also very important feature. Uh, agricultural farms. Um, it is very common to use uh, PVs uh, in such applications uh, because we know that on the other side, uh, agricultural farms are, are very polluting as such. Um, so um, another case could be uh, comprehensive energy retrofit for, for public buildings. We have uh, a huge history of, of successful projects. Uh, I'd just like to mention uh, uh, Brigitte municipality case when we retrofit uh, approximately 15 uh, public buildings. Uh, the case was performed during the pandemic, which is another big achievement for, for us, and we are proud of that. And of course, in the same time, we are running the biggest project in petrol history is uh, retrofit of, of public buildings in, in Ljubljana, capital city. It is the third such project in a row, so we are developing this through the years. Um, and uh, if I go a little bit on the on the on the industrial side, we also have uh, synergies between the industri industry and local communities. Uh, for example, we use uh, waste heat from 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 uh, local steel manufacturing uh, uh, plant uh, and use it 
to heat up the, the water in the distributing cities of, of uh, local city. Um, so the cellular line on top of uh, everything is uh, efficient around the data management. Uh, so for that purpose, we have the solution. Uh, it, we name it Tango, it is a IoT platform and uh, Tango takes care of, of, of smart management and, 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 and running this infrastructure system. And this is very important at the end that we also prove our results and that we maintain to be um, uh, efficient as much as possible through the years, through the life cycle of the project. So, yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Ewald. Of course, we, will, we can talk even more because you have more than 2,000 projects or references in, sure. in the Southeast Europe and you are the leading company and providing end-to-end, -end, you know, from the solutions that are imp implemented uh, within the cities to the platform and all in between. And moving forward, you know, uh, to urban air mobility, which is a new way of mobility in cities by using the third dimension. And we are not talking about noisy airports and heliports. So my question goes to Vasilis. So in most cases, cities are, you know, working on this infrastructure. So my question is, uh, how, you know, we can accelerate this process and how we can achieve that? In fact, uh, thank you, Daniel, for the question. It's not about uh, accelerating, it's more about achieving. Um, as I said during the presentation, we should talk about urban mobility first and then about urban air mobility. Uh, even the initiative uh, that uh, I'm leading uh, with the European cities, the, the motto is uh, walk, ride, drive, fly. So the third dimension, uh, it's about um, uh, the complementary mode, uh, we have to work all together to find out what this uh, complementarity is to be, for what purpose. And as Florian mentioned during uh, his presentation, um, cities uh, save mobility and mobility save cities. Mm -hmm. So this is what we have to keep in mind. Uh, talking about, you know, where you can put vertiports, it is not only a business opportunity where you could uh, capitalize on the potential uh, roof availability. It's about uh, the design of the mobility fabric, the urban mobility fabric. Um, it is about uh, also um, complying with the necessary regulations. Even verticals you know they are subject to regulatory constraints. So it does not mean that we can go and use any rooftop uh, because it is convenient. Uh, you need to, to comply with certain um, uh, regulatory aspects for safety and security. Mm -hmm. And of course, it has to be part of the wider uh, urban mobility nodes. Then there are some other consequences that will appear if we focus on, on the vertical part. Uh, for example, the energy requirements that you may need there. Uh, are you going to, to be able to host the infrastructure required, for example, for um, charging these aircraft or even shopping batteries, where are you going to, to, to store them? Uh, it could be some other ones that maybe you have not thought about. Uh, like imagine you are in a big building and of course the rooftop is at the top. So you have to, you have to use elevator. Uh, if you have really a busy vertical, you are going to use elevator many, many more times. So this means that in the, even the insurance approach of uh, elevators may change because you're going to have more frequent users. Uh, mm -hmm. And this can have an impact uh, on many other areas, not only on the actual uh, cost of, of using, um, but also on whether actually you can use it or not. So achieving this requires that, um, as I always say, the many different actors work together from the beginning, uh, that we plan what we want to do and we don't just um, uh, leave things to, to happen and then adjust. So being proactive here and do learn from all the lessons we have learned from urban mo mobility in general. Uh, for example, we have learned that um, we have overused cars and what cities try to do today is to take uh, cars out of the city. So what are we going to do? Are we going to bring many vehicles on, on the top of the sky? I think no. Uh, so these are, these are the topics that um, 
uh, we have to take responsibility, uh, not only as companies, as a wider society, uh, and plan based on the lessons learned and the future that we want to live. Yes, and we know that European cities are made from the old, you know, historical and protected part. And we are moving cars out, so we are making pedestrians areas wider and wider. And but we also have a privilege, you know, to have at today's roundtable uh, Florian, who has uh, another challenge. You know, uh, they are working on greenfield investment, planning it from uh, the scratch. So, uh, Mr. Lena, uh, during your presentation, you highlighted very well your scale-up approach and how you want to create a global living lab and so on. But I would like to ask you, what are the key priorities for this and next year, you know, for the NEOM? So, um, of course, um, NEOM is a long-term project. And as you, as you saw in the presentation, we are seeking to really implement both a, a very comprehensive um, and integrated both from an urban development and a mobility perspective and an energy and other infrastructure perspective, but we're also doing it on a greenfield side. So of course that did require over the last two years, um, very intensive and careful planning, which we are um, currently concluding. Um, we are also um, already beginning to build out the initial infrastructure that we need. Um, you need to understand we need to build out power, we need to build out water, we need to build out basic um, initial transport infrastructure that then allows us to actually move into the intensive construction phase. So we, we, we are already starting with um, you know the, the implementation of these early infrastructures with the ground preparation. And then the other issue to understand is, is that we're also simultaneously developing um, not just one urban development, but actually um, a, a whole range of them. So these are all proceeding, um, and um, one of the first developments that will be um, coming online is are some of our islands, um, where we will be um, uh, opening our first hotel next year, um, and um, uh, also um, uh, then um, a number of other developments which will come online. The overall time frame for Neom is a 10-year horizon, um, with the first five years dedicated to building out the, the, the core infrastructure and then to complete our urban development. Yes, yes. Uh, and we will come later on also, you know, to, to the topic of, you know, building ecosystems and partnerships. Uh, also, we are receiving questions from the audience that we will shortly ask all the panelists. And going back to Mr. Ewald, so mobility is becoming, you know, autonomous, connected, shared electric. So electrification is one of the most important topics in Europe. We, we are now discussing this on a daily basis. So this is on almost on every board management desk now, this conversation. So there are plenty of, you know, different subventions to support this move to electrification. So uh, I understood Petrol has already prepared a strategy. So what is your plan for becoming one of the key players of building ecosystems, infrastructure, and electrification of the mobility? Uh, you are on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, so we already talked about how sustainable development is very important for petrol. And uh, mobility represents an important part of our strategy. So uh, when we are moving to, to, to future low carbon society and, and also a low, low carbon energy company, uh, partnership with, with, with other stakeholders and, uh, and uh, Others that providing such solution are, are very, very important uh, for our business community in, the, in this next strategic period. So um, as a partner for, for industry, uh, household and public sector, we are, we are undertaking a leading role also uh, uh, in, in environmental goals and, and important inv investment to do that. So, so we will invest roughly 700 million euros in the next five years. But 35% of our investment will be placed in energy transition. Uh, so, as mentioned, uh, mobility and mobility services are important pillar of petrol sustainable and environmental business. And when it comes to mobility, we have two segments that I would like to focus on. So, the first one is linked to charging infrastructure. And uh, which means setting up, managing, uh, uh, and maintaining the infrastructure for charging electric vehicles, and uh, and of course providing a charging service uh, 
as you all know, as 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 a energy company, we have a lot of petrol station, and we provide charging infrastructure not only on them but also in the in the cities uh, as we speak today. And the second segment is uh, is uh, a bunch of mobility services from uh, operating leases to fleet electrification, fleet management services, door to door services, so on and so on. So we would like to, and we'd like to combine all this in one package, and we we call this as uh, mobility services for for the next generation. So up to 2025, uh, we will invest in around one uh, 1,300 uh, new charging points to reach uh, total almost uh, 1,600 uh, charging points in the region, not only Slovenia but in the region. Uh, so, uh, together with roaming services that we provide, uh, we will provide user-friendly and, uh, and efficient e-mobility solutions for our customers, not only in Slovenia, but also in the region, uh, region and uh, Europe. So. Yes, yeah. uh, it's, it's really always impressive hearing from you, you know, the, the progress that you are making, you know, not only 2,000, you know, more than 2,000 projects, but also you are building a new mobility e-mobility solutions, uh, starting with infrastructure, then uh, fleet management, and also, you know, interesting ways to promote it. Uh, so, uh, but going back to, to uh, Vasilis, so public acceptance or how you call it, you know, public embracement is quite an important topic. So for all these new uh, solutions uh, to, to be acceptable by citizens and us humans, so we all know about, you know, public acceptance of cybersecurity, of artificial intelligence, of, I don't know, all these new, uh, um, basically, technologies, and urban air mobility as well. So can you share with us some, I don't know, activities related to public embracement that you are working on and why they are so important for public uh, acceptance? Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we hear the, the word public acceptance a lot when it comes to, to drones, to, to urban air mobility. Also autonomous vehicles. Yes, exactly. When you typically, when you go from the, say, the ground mobility technologies, when they come, the, the acceptance relates a lot to the technology adoption model. Uh, and then the main focus is the user. Uh, so how the user will accept it or adapt it based on the usability of this. Um, this could be fine for established markets, uh, established uh, modes of mobility, where you put uh, a new way of a uh, new product, with some new features. When we go to the, to, the topics, uh, to the topic of urban air mobility, I think it's a bit more complex uh, because this mode, mode does not exist today. So it's about uh, really understanding if there is um, the social contract, in fact, in place for, for having this. Uh, this means that uh, here we cannot just focus on the user. We have to focus on the non-users. And in fact, here, users or non-users, in fact, are the citizens of the city. So we have to focus on the citizens, whether they use it or not. And we have to equally take into consideration the requirements of non-users or the citizens who don't want to use, as with the other ones. In aviation and in the more, say, technology approach, we focus a lot on safety and security. And of course, you can understand these are prerequisites if you ever want to do anything. Uh, and then we start to see there is the issue of noise. And we believe that if we address the noise issue, everything is done. However, it is not. Because what about uh, typical principles of sustainable urban mobility, like uh, equality, inclusion, affordability, yeah. and so on? So we need to ensure that all of these aspects of, of the wider society are involved. How do we do this? We use the cities to drive the dialogue. We use the cities to become uh, the actual place where the many different actors, whether it could be ministries or associations, can express their concerns and try to find solutions by having the, um, the city officials to drive uh, the discussion. Um, I have mentioned about uh, the manifesto on the multi-level uh, governance of the urban sky. This is an example. 
of, of this sort of public appropriation uh, where the cities express their concerns, the regulators, the commission listens, and the regulatory framework then is saved uh, through a bottom-up approach. But at the same time, we need the top-down. Uh, and it is this facilitation of dialogues at different layers of governance uh, that need to be facilitated. And this is what we try even to, to see how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just involving the citizens themselves, of course, this is key, but it's not only that when we talk about public acceptance. That's why we use the term social embracement or societal embracement to indicate that the many different actors, whether public authorities or other public entities and associations, all need to have a voice that uh, has to be considered. Yes, and as you know, I am also coming from a living lab, which is AV, stands for Autonomous Vehicles Living Lab, and this is exactly what we also do on a daily basis, and I can share the difference. So, in 2018, we did um, first testing of Autonomous Shuttle, and there were no steering wheel. Uh, and it was interesting to observe people entering in and you need to go to the display and touch, you know, the point B and so on. And we surveyed them before and after and we saw the results and it was really amazing. So uh, I'm a big fan of, of Living Lab. So I really like, you know, the Florian's idea of a global Living Lab. So the question for Florian, uh, how can cities, companies, so today we heard, you know, Vasilis is leading uh, the UAM initiative of European cities. Abel is coming, you know, from company Patrol with they have end-to-end -end solutions. So how can companies and cities, uh, especially the urban air mobility developers, partner with you and with your lab? Yes, absolutely. And we're very interested in, in developing these relationships, these partnerships, these supplier relationships. We are currently um, moving from the planning stage into the implementation stage. Um, and um, we'd be very happy to, to discuss specifically with different participants today um, how they might be able to get involved. And, and this can, of course, happen on various levels. One is we need to move into the actual build out of the infrastructure, of the bringing together our solar and wind generation with the charging infrastructure, with the smart grids, with the, the vehicle uh, uh, systems. Um, we also are interested on the AV front um, to uh, work with a number of um, uh, suppliers and partners. We're looking at um, uh, a co um, evolving and developing and, and, and working together on R&D research. We will be developing a number of innovation hubs um, both targeted at startups, but also at um, larger companies. Um, so there's really a wide portfolio of, um, of ways in which um, uh, we're looking to partner and collaborate. But of course, we also have this incredible opportunity in, the, um, in that um, we have all these wonderful solutions that exist in the world um, that are often constrained by the legacy environments we're operating in in cities. And having worked on this in, over um, a few decades in Europe, um, so often you cannot advance these things, such, for instance, autonomous vehicles um, within the existing legacy infrastructure. But at the same time, also, um, often we focus on one single innovation when really the value of the, um, these innovations come together when you, when you connect them, when you connect the vehicles to the smart grid, when you connect it to the right on-demand service architecture. So it's building the, the ability to have a living lab where everyone can contribute their segment of the solution but it comes together in a, in, a, in, a, in a holistic and functioning ecosystem. And that's the great advantage we have in NEOM. And that's where we, we, you know, we're inviting people to come and join. We have um, uh, great um, facilities as well as, as a regulatory environment for you to come and test. So we're very interested to collaborating with um, UAM companies that might want to still develop their technology, come and fly and do some piloting here. Um, and equally with um, autonomous um, ground surface systems. So um, really, there's a there's a there's a wide um, uh, interface there, and I'd be happy to have um, in the follow up more more specific conversations with um, with with uh, uh, people interested parties. Yes, and I'm I'm also you know uh, see the benefit you know when uh, more stakeholders are coming together, and this was also one of the approaches that in Europe we do quite often. Uh, so we also have questions from the audience. So. Uh, for I'm going to just stay with you uh, because you are basically building up the city. So what would be the role of the new uh, uh, mobile networks like 5G? 
Uh, are you already implementing that or this is uh, in, in a process? And maybe I can just say for our living lab, so we have private 5G network. We, of course, we have 4G and all others. We also have the private Wi-Fi and all of Netoband. So, but it's, it's, uh, it's more than 60 years of development in our case. So Neum is, is still progressing, but I would like to hear your view on communications. Absolutely, absolutely vital. And it's a, it's a, it's a key sector, infrastructural sector for us to develop. Um, and that's starting from actually having our own deep sea cable backbone internet connection that we're currently delaying um, uh, through the Red Sea um, that goes to, and we've already begun implementing 5G here in our existing community. We already have a community mm -hmm. of about a thousand people, where, which we're already using as a living lab. Um, uh, and then, of course, um, um, in the end, being able to provide ubiquitous 5G services across the entire territory of Neon, which, of course, is as big as Belgium. So we are actively building out already the required um, uh, communications infrastructure because that is, of course, fundamental to um, unlock both surface-based autonomous systems to unlock the um, UAM and the um, and you know all kinds of drones applications and the autonomy within that, but also a whole range of city services that we want to uh, integrate and where we really want to you know have these self-organizing interlocking urban infrastructures. And that, that is absolutely vital to have that in place. So um, we've already um, uh, established a partnership with one of the, the, the leading um, suppliers on, and providers here and are actually building out a 5G network as we speak. Okay, great. Uh, so Vasilis, uh, just quick question. So this European initiative is not limited only to European cities, but it's a wider uh, initiative. So also external cities can uh, basically uh, join these initiatives in a certain way. Is this... Correct. Well, I would say I would say in a certain way, the UN Initiative Cities Community is part of the EU's Smart Cities Marketplace. Mm -hmm. So, by definition, it's about uh, the the member states uh, of of, the, of Europe. So it is supported by the European Commission, um, but um, we are uh, collaborating or we are starting to collaborate uh, with international cities as a way of uh, exchanging uh, experiences between the cities, learning from each other, and uh, effectively uh, creating, a, I would say, a wider community and mm -hmm. the city led on the or region led uh, on the top. Yeah, yeah, and I also, I'm also happy you know, to share with our audience that Ljubljana is also part of this initiative Absolutely. and that we are working together uh, closely. So, uh, Mr. Ewald, you know, the whole idea about this city platform or, you know, the platform Tango is really appealing because we see cities are, you know, having some legacy systems. Uh, could this also be a solution for all these future cities uh, you know, to partner with a company such as Petrol, who has so many years of experience, uh, because what is the most important is the experience coming from implementations. And this is what, you know, incumbents like Petrol can provide. So uh, are you also open, you know, to partner with these future cities or mega cities uh, in the future? Why not? So, so uh, uh, our our aim is to, to, to move forward. As you you, you saw uh, in, in our strategy, we, we have really ambitious uh, targets, and and uh, perhaps we haven't considered uh, such let's say broad uh, uh, introduction on the market so far. But but why not in the future? So we are ready. We have the the tools. We have the knowledge, as you mentioned. And uh, and we should be and we will be ready to to, to address such challenges. Um, well, I'm looking forward to the next City as a Lab Summit 2022 to hear more about the progress. So, with that, I would like to conclude this roundtable. I would really like to thank all our panelists and also the keynote speakers for sharing the valuable information. The roundtable was very informative and insightful and. Uh, audience feel free to reach out to our speakers via linkedin social media networks you know for future collaboration and partnerships so thank you and i'm giving word back to Peter. thank you 
Thank you all for generating so many breakthrough ideas. I am sure that by working together, we can create a better society with friendly economy and decent living for all. In the next section, we will talk about smart logistics and smart factories. The fourth industrial revolution brings many technological, economic, organizational and social changes that change production and logistics. In today's section, we will learn how companies are coping with changes in logistics, smart workplaces and factories. Our next speaker will talk about what are the value drivers in smart factories and how to create business value from connected logistics and mobility. The Internet of Things is without a doubt the fourth industrial revolution and its effects on the logistics and mobility sectors are already changing businesses and companies. What challenges are companies facing when implementing Internet of Things and machine learning solutions? And what is the application evolution roadmap for smart factories? Showcasing and explaining the challenges with real-life examples is the director of Vertical Market Solutions in company AENA, Mr. Francis Capero. Hello and welcome to, the, um, to this event where we're going to talk about IoT and advanced logistics. My name is Francis Sapero. I'm Director of Vertical Markets at A1 Digital. And I would like to first, first and foremost introduce you to A1 Digital. What are we doing in the market? Where are we coming from? And um, basically, what is our focus? Our focus is cloud, IoT, machine learning and security. And we are a company, uh, part of the A1 Group, a uh, subsidiary of A1 Telecom Austria Group, part of American Mobile. Uh, we have three locations in Central Europe, in Vienna, in Munich, and Lausanne. And uh, we are around 200 employees, experts in these four technology areas that I mentioned before. Uh, currently, we have more than 1,500 customers, and we have run more than 500 international IoT uh, projects. Uh, we have been selected by Gartner uh, into the global magic quadrant for IoT services in 2020. And with that, I think we have um, reached that level of you know, global expertise that allows us to do more complex projects and discuss more complex, complex topics, like the ones that we are going to discuss today about logistics. Uh, what are the classic problems in logistics that we see today when we discuss with our customers? We have grouped them in, in, a, in, a, in a set of um, uh, categories. We see problems with asset operations. We see problems with optimization, with demand visibility. Uh, and specifically, when we talk about asset profitability being heavily impacted by inefficient planning, um, the availability of the assets being impacted by idle times and maintenance times, uh, we don't see customers uh, making use of optimized uh, and integrated planning, route planning continues being an issue because so, there are so many inputs into this planning um, and so many constraints into this planning that it's very difficult for them to make use of this in the, in the old uh, uh, non-digital world. And so demand visibility is also an issue where we see um, that many companies have few insights and uh, they don't use machine learning models for demand and supply chain uh, predictions. Uh, we also see many manual planning exercises being done by, by our client. And of course, this leads to all the customer engagement issues that we know, you know, inability to adapt to growing demands and to growing and to changing uh, conditions in the, in the, in the market. So if we look at the next um, perspective on how to solve those problems, fundam at a fundamental way, we look at uh, real-time logistics. And this, this is basically a combination of two core technology assets. One is the IoT solutions and platforms that will allow you to have a real-time management, real-time visibility on assets and shipments. And the second one is the advanced uh, logistic planning platform that is capable of doing a multi multi-model uh, prediction and modeling of transportation networks. So all your transportation routes and your hubs are going are to be planned in real time, 
being cognizant of the data and where the shipment actually is and what is the current status of the assets. So let us go into a little bit more of detail into this direction. So the trend of integrated asset management is one of the core trends in the last um, couple of years that we have seen. And this is the foundation for digital uh, transformation in the logistics. And the target should be, in our opinion, for many of our clients, to create one single system to view and to maintain and to manage all the assets and tools in a central location in a central enterprise asset management system. And here you see an example of a, um, a logistic um, company from the rails. We have a couple of them in, as our clients. And the idea is really to manage all of what they can, uh, what, what they own in one single system that allows for visibility a complete transparency on the procurement process. There's a lot of benefits from this. I'm, I'm not going to abound on that because it's only, I'm going to be only on the surface. But if you look at the next uh, perspective, how this influence, influences maintenance, you can see that enterprise asset management systems, and in this case, we have taken the, the, the system from Infor, our partner for enterprise asset management. You can combine real-time sensors, uh, real-time data coming from IoT sensors with uh, operations like maintenance, with operations like the, you know, the, the, the repair, uh, the purchasing process. So all of this becomes an integrated operation and allows for um, a, a management of a, a fleet much more efficiently. Uh, and at the same time, it gives you always the availability of your assets. Where are they? How are they being used? So this is super important take this into account. And if you think that this is a very complex process in order to get there, it is not. So we have done projects and secure transitions of about six months, three to six months for very large companies. So this should not be a problem. Also for mid-sized companies, this is possible. If we look at the next topic, which is integrated logistic planning, in there we see that all this data that has been captured in real time about the shipments and about the assets, um, including, of course, location, temperature, humidity. So all of the, not only the data of the, of, the, of the transportation asset, but also of the cargo. So what happens to the cargo? What is the situation? That will be informing better decisions around route planning, will be informing better decisions about um, prescriptive and, 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 and predictive analytics uh, around customer demand, uh, the, you know, which is this, the right service provider to use. Uh, and of course, at the end, this will enable a better simulation of the specific scenarios that you, that you will use. So you can imagine if you have to, let's say you capture peak demands and you predict peak demands in specific uh, supply scenarios, if you plan faster than your competitors, you will be able to take this peak demand. And what we are trying to create here with the IoT platforms and the real-time uh, integrated logistic planning is the ability to be more agile in the planning process. So by doing that, you're able to react faster to any sort of unpredicted or, or uh, unforeseen demand uh, in the market. You know where your assets are, you know where your ship shipments are, you have simulated uh, and, and you can do predictions and prescriptions about what to do with your, with your assets and your routes and your service providers. And now all of this is integrated into one planning scenario that does planning automatically at any degree of capillarity in your supply chain and in your distribution channels. So coming to the last minute uh, of our presentation, I think what is important here, key takeaways, please work on integrating IoT and machine learning in, into your modern asset management systems. This will add a lot of value. Work on integrated planning logistics. This is the next trend that we are seeing with our clients and this adding a lot of value and lowering uh, a customer acquisition costs dramatically. And last but not least, remember that IoT and, and all the digitalization is the team sport. So it's a partnership between your business experts and your tech experts. And if you need any help, we at A1 Digital can help you um, in, in, in this process. Thank you very much. Mr. Capero, thank you very much. In Slovenia and also in the region, we cannot wait for all your plans to come true. Acting fast and precise is very important in the logistics sector. In the following presentation, the speaker from the company Cargo Partner will explain how they keep supply chains 
running even in the times of disruption, how they make their clients' warehousing more efficient and how they support the E-Trade, especially in times of huge growth. All this will be presented through three case studies. So, I am glad to invite our next guest, Mr. Viktor Kastilic, Managing Director of Cargo Partner Slovenia. Hello and welcome to the world of logistics, transport thousands of tons of cargo and dynamic solutions we create every day. My name is Viktor Kastilic and I have been leading Cargo Partner Slovenia for 10 years. Today, I will show you three case studies. You will see how we keep supply chains running, even in times of disruptions, how we make our clients' warehousing more efficient, and how we support e-commerce segment, which saw incredible expansion during the pandemic. Cargo Partner is an international full-range info-logistics provider with nearly 40 years of expertise in supply chain optimization. It offers a comprehensive portfolio of air, sea, road, and rail transport, as well as warehousing solutions and custom clearance. We design tailor-made services for a wide range of industries, like pharmaceuticals and he healthcare, high technology, automotive, e-commerce, foodstuff and perishables, and fashion and lifestyle. Cargo Partner Group has more than 130 offices in 40 countries and over 3,000 employees worldwide. Following our slogan, we take it personally. We strive to create tailor-made solutions, create long-lasting relationships, and provide the highest quality of our services. Therefore, we developed competence centers for each key industry. In our first case study, I will introduce a smart warehousing solution in automotive competence center at Dunajska Streda, Slovakia, for our valued automotive customer. This customer is a leading automotive supplier whose customers include Audi, Skoda, Jaguar, Land Rover, etc. They demanded full transparency and highest precision in logistics processes to ensure smooth production flows. Therefore, Cargo Partner made a commitment to maintain a warehouse accuracy of at least 99.9%. That means there is almost no room for mistakes. What did we do? We set up an end-to-end -end logistics solution covering the entire process from inbound to outbound logistics, including managing of call-offs, specific packaging, industry standard compliant labeling, and so on. We set up numerous electronic data interchange connections with end customers and thus a short high level of automation and accuracy. We ensure goods are always prepared just in time for pickup and production flows are running smoothly. When in 2020 supply chains broke due to lockdowns and restrictions taken by numerous countries, it was a great challenge to ensure mobility of cargo. We had to react quickly and find new solutions. Cargo Partner developed new rail services via the new Silk Road, organized regular weekly charters from Far East, and also introduced emergency service. Here we come to the second case study. In November 2020, Cargo Partner Slovenia received an inquiry for a highly urgent shipment consisting of almost 2,000 car tires, which had to be transported from Thailand to the United Kingdom. Delivery failure could result in a production shutdown and consequently an astronomical contract penalty for our customer. Since the timeline was extremely short, we booked a charter flight with passenger aircraft. But just the day before the flight was scheduled, airline canceled it due to COVID-19 infections among the crew members. We had to find an alternative door-to-door -door solution in a few hours only. And we did it. We found a new airline, loaded tires on aircraft, we custom cleared them immediately after landing and delivered them to the re recipient exactly at the specific time. Furthermore, the pandemic had a great impact on another business segment, e-commerce. Because of safety measures and lockdowns, many activities have moved online 
and online shopping has experienced a real boom. Many of online retailers double their revenue, some even triples. This chart shows demand index for Slovenia and Croatia. You see that demand was much higher in 2020 as in 2019, especially during first and second wave of the pandemic, much more than in regular peak season. The largest increase in purchases was in the segment of toys and computer equipment for personal use, where sales increased up to 240%. The rapid growth brought new challenges for online retailers. Due to sudden increase in traffic, many of them have faced a lack of storage capacity, lack of staff, and improper IT system. They could not process orders in a timely manner, provide all fulfillment services, or manage their inventory. How can we help? Firstly, we can assure enough staff and space. More than 6,000 square meters in iLogistics Center Ljubljana, only for fulfillment services, with storing and manipulating the goods in a controlled temperature regime and in accordance with HATSAP standard. Secondly, thanks to excellent geostrategic location, we can assure fast delivery throughout Slovenia and the wider region from the Balkans to Central and Eastern Europe. Our customers benefit from using network of cargo partner distribution centers, achieving higher cost efficiency. And thirdly, we offer comprehensive IT support, which enable us to automate the processes and provide all value-added services online retailer needs. And here we come to the third case study. It is about an e-commerce customer, a US company specialized for baby carriers and accessories. Firstly, we set up an API connection to the web shop on Shopify platform. This enables us to receive orders directly from the web shop into our IT system and to automatically fulfill them in the warehouse. Our employees pick the ordered items, prepare, prepare packages and hand them over to the parcel delivery provider. Our customer receives automated order confirmation and the end customer receives the notification that the package is on its way. In this way, we significantly reduce the volume of administrative work, of manual work and greatly reduce the possibility of errors. In addition, we provide real-time order tracking and 24-7 access to up-to-date inventory data. On demand, we can also take care of the return logistics. What are our plans for the future? We will keep developing our services. One big step forward will be the expansion of Cargo Partner iLogistics Center Ljubljana. In the additional 14,000 square meters of new capacities, we will introduce modern material handling technologies such as goods-to-person shuttle systems, automated guided vehicles, and drone dispatch port. Part of the new facility will be adjusted to e-commerce services with all equipment and infrastructure needed, including personal parcel pickup and return point. The pandemic changed the world in many ways. It has accelerated the process of digitalization and pushed us forward to find new ways and offer new services. We have proved to be a reliable and innovative logistics partner and passionate for what we do. With our know-how, state-of-the-art IT system and highly skilled employees, we will keep the goods moving and the world rolling. Thank you and stay healthy. Thank you, Mr. Kastilic. With us is also Ms. Erin Beilharz from Lufthansa Systems. KG draws their unique strengths from an ability to combine profound industry know-how with technological expertise and many years of project experiences. Formed as a spin-off of the Lufthansa Systems Group's Airline Solutions Division, the company continues the brand now familiar to the airline industry. How and what this company plans for the future will be shared with us by Ms. Balharts. Hello, I'm Erin Balharts and Big thank you to City as a Lab Summit for the opportunity to speak with all of these esteemed guests today. 
Um, I work as a digital consultant uh, for Lufthansa Systems. We are a um, IT company. We're the IT arm of the Lufthansa Group. Uh, we have a lot of big complex IT products that we serve um, airlines with things like revenue management, operations, demand forecasting, network and route optimization, all of that good stuff. I work as a consultant, uh, translating some of the ideas uh, that we have within the airline industry into logistics, mobility, um, including urban air mobility as a big focus, uh, energy and retail industries. Um, today, I wanted to put my view of future cities into a bit of a context, and I'd like to give you, from my perspective, three demands, um, three examples which will shape demand on logistics in the future. So for me, the important topics are the ideas of circularity, uh, demand forecasting and real time logistics. If we move into the idea of servicing future wants and needs, uh, the way that we are absolutely addicted to having everything that I want right now and the quality that I want. Back in 2019, uh, I saw IKEA present uh, their urban village project concept, which is a collaboration between Space 10, which is basically the IKEA playground lab where they try out different uh, technologies and ideas concepts and um, effect architects. The idea of this concept of the urban village project is that people in the future will change, uh, but they don't need to necessarily be bound to their um, possessions anymore, the homes. Um, so they've done this with real estate where you can buy into a project and be a co-owner um, in the finance company, which is um, owning the project where you live. So these IKEA communities in the future, not only will they be um, communities where you can change from single to couple to uh, parents with children and back down to empty nest um, and then stay within your community, but they're also going to be uh, filled with a bunch of products and services by different service providers. So I think the future logistics of city is going to be highly dependent around this idea of servicing things. Um, first of all, understanding that things are going to be loaned to people and people will just use uh, products and not necessarily own them. The idea that the different suppliers of all of these products and services will have to know beforehand what uh, people are going to want and predict uh, the demand of different products and services um, along the chain. And then uh, the way to get them delivered quickly and efficiently um, and also affordably for the companies. So we have a company called Loop that's also an interesting example where they have uh, changed the idea from FMCG goods uh, from, from just buying uh, groceries and then taking the packaging and throwing it away to having this uh, rotable packaging uh, where you order stuff, uh, you order your Ben & Jerry's ice cream and it's delivered in a metal container with Ben & Jerry's uh, cookies and cream logo on it, a beautiful packaging. You eat the ice cream, you put the dirty thing back in this big loop bag and it's picked up again. And you have all of these uh, logistics around ordering a plethora of different products from different companies, having it delivered and having it uh, come back so that you don't create waste anymore. So think about the logistics uh, behind this whole operation and what that could mean for your business maybe. Um, there's another example of a e-retail company called Shine, a Chinese company, and they're currently linking um, what people are currently looking at in uh, their e-commerce shop and what they're putting in their baskets, and they're automatically um, relaying this to the forecast planning of the production uh, so that uh, the people on the sewing machines in the factories in China are then uh, reflecting uh, things which have been put in baskets um, in the demand and uh, production forecast in real time. So this is all rather new and it has a huge impact on, um, I think, the way that logistics in cities are going to work in the future. If this utopic vision that I'm describing is going to come true, uh, I think the scale and the scope um, will really have to change and the technology that is required to link all of these things together needs to become more and more seamless and, and uh, connected. 
So if I think about what we're already doing within the airline industry, and if I think of the airline industry as essentially a big closed loop with a lot of assets, a lot of um, customers, a lot of uh, service providers, logistics, and all of these um, different players um, all working on the same network together to produce a product and service. Um, we have a lot of learnings uh, from the airline industry and from aviation that we can kind of translate over into mobility and logistics. So for instance, at Lufthansa Systems, we use optimizers in all kinds of different areas of our IT products. Um, uh, using different methodologies, different types of algorithms, using AI, machine learning, you name it, uh, to do things like forecast demand, create dynamic prices for tickets. So we have also um, the idea of this shine production. Um, we have this idea of when somebody's looking at a specific flight or a specific destination that we say, okay, this business could end up being ours. And um, checking of the competitors as well um, where they are able to buy and a constant comparison of prices so that we can have a much better um, result and we have a much much better idea of whether somebody will buy this ticket with us um, buy this ticket today put it in the basket think about it and uh, what the price um, uh, development should be on a specific um, root pair for a specific person. So these are all things which we're currently using within aviation, which are going to translate um, very much into this future city idea of what is the right price for the right product at the right time and how to get it to them. With regards to reducing costs, which is another huge uh, factor as well for airlines with such a big uh, network of assets. Um, we have a pretty cool project uh, called uh, the OPSD, which is, stands for the Operation Decision Support Suite. Now, this is um, a project done by Swiss, and it's uh, essentially an AI-aided decision-making tool, um, which takes a look at any kind of flight irregularities or delays and makes a prognosis of whether somebody should be um, just sent directly to a hotel if they connecting flights should wait for a few passengers um, or if it will cause carry-on delays uh, for the next flight and uh, extrapolates the entire cost of different scenarios over the entire system. So if you're talking about a company um, with the scale of Swiss or the scale of Lufthansa Group, then these kind of decisions can really save a lot of money and even save a lot of headaches for passengers. Um, and they also create some pain points for passengers, which are also brought into the algorithms with regards to, you know, things like loyalty and uh, how people feel about um, the company finally. Um, we also have a very cool example from my time at uh, LSG, which is the catering company of Lufthansa. Um, at the time we were doing um, pre-orders. Um, so when a passenger is booking a flight, they're able to, to choose a meal. Um, and as soon as they're booking this flight and getting into the selection, potentially this passenger has already been profiled that we already know what kind of taste they have uh, with regards to food and that this forecasting when this known passenger is already looking at uh, specific flights that can already go into the, um, the production forecast within the regional production unit to maybe make more of this type of food that we think they will choose finally. Um, so these things are already at home in our company um, in, in different areas and I think that they can be really nicely translated into this future city idea as well. With regards to yeah, maintaining this whole system and making sure that the assets are able to be used and they're not falling out due to big repairs or things like that, we have quite a few projects as well um, where we've implemented computer vision backed by AI uh, to detect, detect damage or um, uh, detect patterns, um, which we can then use to uh, make our business a bit smarter. We have a pretty cool um, deep turnaround app that we have developed using computer vision uh, uh, within Zero G, uh, which is our AI and um, data analytics company. And this here you can see on the video is to detect 
bottlenecks from the different service providers coming to service an aircraft. Um, this can be translated into all kinds of cool applications for harbors, for trains, for anything where there's um, a huge network of service providers uh, choreographed together to, to deliver something. Um, we've also got a project that we've done maintenance inspection with uh, together with CRG and the Transit Technic. Um, this as well has great applications of using uh, drones for maintenance um, um, aircraft uh, inspection or we've used it as well on runway inspection um, as well as Lufthansa Technic and another project together with Fraport, uh, the airport in Frankfurt. So lots of different um, areas of application for that. We're also using um, OCRs, optical character recognition software, um, and we have been using this uh, currently in a project to analyze tweets for passenger satisfaction. Um, um, going through tweets and seeing and uh, categorizing different areas of the business and how uh, the passengers are feeling about it according to the language that they're using. So this character recognition we've been using as well uh, within our digital delivery lab in Gdansk to, um, to try and discover some, um, some quicker uh, automated ways of doing COVID screening uh, document reading um, in order to analyze test status, and vaccine status and stuff like that, because we see these bottlenecks coming up in our business um, as people start traveling again of how to deal with all of this. The real-time logistics part, I would say last but not least for this presentation, um, I think there's going to be a lot more robotics, a lot more, a lot less drivers in the future. Um, and we are looking uh, very deeply into drone delivery and um, have quite a few interesting projects within the Lufthansa group as well. Um, we had a project uh, delivering medication between two hospitals and, and uh, um, medical uh, devices within two hospitals of Hamburg um, with Lufthansa Technik because they wanted to a little bit simulate and learn about the mechanical operations of drones and how this is different. Uh, from aircraft because this is a future business for us that we want to explore and uh, and um, learn about. We have the Volo IQ project, which is an absolute lighthouse project for um, Lufthansa Industry Solutions uh, to develop with Volocopter, Volocopter's proprietary IT to do the entire drone taxi and uh, cargo drone operational software suite, uh, booking, uh, network planning, flight planning, um, getting all of the data from different sensors into the system so that they can um, monitor and uh, assess how the different vehicles are doing, putting things in like predictive maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all areas that I think are leading towards this real-time delivery within, uh, within future cities. and. Uh, I think exciting to be to be a part of this um, as a service provider to some of these other companies. So thank you so much. Again, the last takeaway is circular economies for future cities, demand forecasting and real time logistics are, um, I think, crucial to this industry. Um, if you are a logistics company and want to find out more about any of these uh, ideas that I was talking about or see how it might be applicable to what you're doing then uh, reach out on LinkedIn or whatever. I'm uh, happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. But we aren't done yet. I am happy to announce our second round table. As we can see, mobility services across the board are facing a revolution to wrap up everything we heard till now and offer some insights into how are companies coping with changes in logistics, smart workplaces and factories. Mrs. Claudia Jans from AV Living Lab will lead our second round table. The house rules are the same as before. Claudia, I see you are eager to begin. The floor is yours. Hello, hello everyone. As Petra mentioned, my name is Claudia and I am so excited to be here with you guys at our logistics 
and Smart Factories Roundtable. Joining me are the following experts on the field. Ms. Mariana St. Charsadic, the Head of IoT Technology and Innovation within the company A1. Mr. Nenad Reisman, Business uh, Director Business Development and Trade Lane Manager for Great China at Carlo Partner. Erin Bailhas, Consultant Digital Project and Transformation at Lufthansa Systems. Your panelists, welcome. Before we dig into the questions, just some house rules uh, for everyone in the audience. Please feel free to send in your questions in the chat. Probably mentioned the questions to be asked so I can add them to our amazing speakers. So let's kick off. Um, I'm going to start with a question for you, Mariana. This was a demanding year behind us. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic has affected almost every sector. For example, almost all manufacturers have grappled with the supply chain distribution. Did this affect the telecommunication industry as well? And how did it affect your company in particular? Of course, like any other industry, we also needed to adapt to this new situation. Uh, in our case, this shift to uh, remote working and homeschooling led into a huge increase for every service that we actually provide uh, all of our core services, some from voice to data to even television. So um, we were lucky enough that we have good uh, technical departments that really plan capacity several years ahead. So already during the first uh, lockdown, uh, our um, transport capacities were actually doubled uh, uh, almost overnight. So uh, colleagues did a tremendous job on this one. Uh, we adapted uh, our sales channels. We included a new one, actually a uh, virtual shop, uh, some kind of combination of a uh, shop experience, uh, but enhanced with video fit, uh, direct communication with the shop, ass shop assistant. Uh, while uh, the shops were locked. Um, and um, last but not least, uh, very important, um, uh, the 5G uh, auction concluded in April this year in Slovenia. We acquired quite some uh, frequency spectra. This is Im important um, uh, in this regards because, uh, you know, frequency spectrum is a limited natural resource. And in such increased capacities, uh, frequencies are a very important part of, of the providing the whole uh, service that we provide to our customers. Um, we are able to enhance this um, or space that we now uh, lease with uh, um, expertise of our colleagues uh, from the Telecom Austria group that was already mentioned before by Francis. Um, one of the interesting cases that was done already um, year, a year ago because uh, in Austria we acquired this more, most interesting 5G spectrum in March uh, 2019 already. Uh, was the uh, project with uh, OBB, so uh, Austrian Railways. Uh, where we provided a separate slice for them, for their uh, train control systems, to get them um, uh, instant information about uh, the um, uh, tension systems uh, directly to the control room, so that uh, um, we can now provide uh, services like this also to other customers, uh, also in Slovenia. Uh, we are um, getting experience, uh, combining experience, expertise from our colleagues uh, with more than 900 already uh, done projects. Uh, several of those were mentioned before also in, in the speech from Francis. Uh, we are um, uh, providing companies tools to um, uh, manage intelligent supply chains with uh, products like A1 uh, Industrial Insight, uh, then Asset Insight, uh, providing tools for maintaining optimal uh, inventory levels with uh, A1 in Inventory Insight. So um, we can en enhance this uh, uh, opportunity with a lot of expertise. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 5G is important uh, factor for unlocking the digital digitalization in every uh, vertical, basically, uh, and should be um, certainly um, implemented by uh, agile co-development. Uh, since we are talking in a smart factory panel, uh, 5G has been around uh, wireless uh, 
connectivity has been around in factories for several years already, from Bluetooth to uh, wireless LAN to wireless heart uh, uh, and all the Gs of previous mobile generations. But it's, it's been used just to, to up to 2% actually. Um, this, be, this is because of many hurdles uh, there were uh, on this way, uh, standardization, uh, lack of proper equipment, uh, security concerns, and in case of 5G, even politics. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, some cases could be already provided uh, with uh, artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence on edge and uh, some smart components. Um, typical are uh, AVGs, uh, robots, uh, digital twins that could already be done with, with previous uh, technologies. However, there are some specific cases within the smart factory that could actually be better provided with use of 5G, uh, like, uh, for example, um, real-time uh, imagery uh, wherever you are with no data loss, with, with perfect imagery. Uh, and for example, some AR, VR um, uh, solutions for assembly lines. Um, so looking at 5G as um, overall, I see it as a very important component uh, for uh, competitiveness, not just for Slovenian industry, but uh, EU as a whole. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mariana. And as you mentioned in the first part of your answer, uh, E-commerce has really, um, it has really grown. Um, it became really popular. Everyone is shopping online. I personally know that I am guilty of that. So that's kind of what we've been experiencing, this huge growth of e-commerce and disruptions. So Maynard, um, I believe that this exponential growth has caused a higher demand in logistic services. How can new technologies help us overcome these challenges? How can they make the job easier? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, a nice greeting from iLogistics Center Ljubljana. Uh, yes, correct. Uh, as Claudia already said, e-commerce has experienced uh, tremendous growth in the last two to three years from obvious reasons. Uh, if you still think only year 15, there was like uh, presenting 5 to 7% of the world retail value while last year numbers are showing being around uh, 18% mm -hmm. and uh, the trend is still ongoing and we see it going strong for the next three to five years, reaching up to 20% in the year 24 or 25. Uh, so yeah, that is correct. Uh, obvious reasons are here. Uh, if now at the moment it's around four and a half, uh, 4.9 trillion dollars already, it's actually replacing uh, the standard retail sector Physically, uh, retail areas are being shut down in the world and e-commerce and uh, this kind of purchases is stepping in. So uh, what we need to do here is, of course, be uh, vigil with it and uh, try to mitigate all the uh, challenges that e-commerce industries are facing. Uh, out of five, top five uh, biggest challenges, uh, three touch logistics, I would say completely. Uh, with, with first two being uh, the listing of their portfolios on online and uh, personalization of scale. And then they immediately uh, come across our customers, the, the challenges on the logistics with this being a uh, lack of resources generally, either in people or in time. And also the resource, uh, the, the returns management, which is uh, really important, uh, being a part of packages, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, trying to shop on, on, on known portals. They even uh, give you offer. To, to take 10 products and return nine and so on, and these need to run. And of course, the general international expansion, which is about logistics and transports and good networks. So yeah, what we can do with them is, uh, with these challenges is uh, basically we first need to remove all the complex processes uh, and of course, bring everything down to the modern world platform. Uh, so yeah, with different information, uh, but first of all, you need to have a good running network of uh, transports as well, not just the hubs and uh, these uh, last mile solutions. Offer a comprehensive portfolio of transport solutions. Like when e-commerce started booming last year, 
It was amazing. Uh, we have shipped e-commerce products basically on all modalities, being rail uh, from Asia, being emergency services, charter services, standard sea freight and LCL services from Cargo Partner. And this uh, was really something to see. Uh, what we do uh, in Cargo Partner is we constantly evolve our uh, portfolio of services and also IT products. Uh, we have our own spot platform where customers, uh, let's say, archive and input all sorts of data, like from major points up to the smallest details. I don't want to be boring with uh, too many. Uh, and this enables then the flow of, of the, it's, it's actually a joint uh, services from uh, coming from door in Asian locations, usually up to door in European locations where we are. Uh, and uh, yeah, the most important three things that we need to be taken care of with these data on these platforms and our systems is there, that their orders are, are processed fast, fast and uh, with precision, that then we offer also a comprehensive e-fulfillment services. So this is the hub handling and last mile deliveries and all uh, services in between. And of course, the mentioned returns management. It sounds like you have your work cut out for you, Nenad, and those numbers were quite impressive. Sure. Uh, as, you have as, as you have mentioned, managing resources is truly the key, and it's also the key when it comes to sustainability, especially in cities. They have to manage infrastructure, spaces, even services. But what can cities implement from the experience and the knowledge that you have gained at Lufthansa Systems? especially in the areas of in-demand forecasting, where we work with data, optimization, processes, automatization. What can be done for the benefit of both cities and citizens? Erin? Good, well, thank you so much. I'm happy to be part of this group, so thanks so much for the opportunity. I think that the airline business is an extremely complex business, and it's one that I'm um, very excited to work and sometimes a frustrating one. We are always operating actually very close to um, the margin. So we, we're not a super lucrative business. In order to make money like some of the other businesses, we really need to pinch pennies. And how do we do that? It cannot be... Um, at the service of our passengers because they will notice us uh, these discrepancies and they will leave us for greener pastures. So what we do within the Lufthansa group and Lufthansa systems being the, the kind of technical supporting company of Lufthansa group companies, we optimize, we optimize like crazy. Um, we actually have built, uh, because we have so many optimizers in our different IT products, we've actually built an optimization platform, which allows us to pull in different types of data and then to have a, an algorithm separately that we can run and we can test the algorithm and see how it's performing. Um, or we can run separate algorithms behind each other or alongside each other and kind of compare them and we can tweak them. Um, and the old way was to have all of these optimization, basically these long um, algorithms, these long strips of code in our products. And now we've found that we can reuse some of the logic and, and tweak it and, and manage it. And we can optimize for things like on-time um, uh, arrivals, or uh, we can optimize for things like how we can best use our fleet, um, optimize for cost, optimize for revenue. So to give you an example, if we have a whole network of moving products, and this is going to actually translate into a lot of the services that you mentioned for cities. Cities are the owners of a lot of bus companies and um, yeah, metro services and basically the whole mobility area. Um, we have to optimize our assets because they're really expensive and we have to optimize everything to become more sustainable because we're in one of these industries which is having um, a moment of unpopularity in our industry in general at the moment with COVID is, you know, I can say it's a disaster area. We're trying to recover, but this is very hard. So this cost saving and, and trying to really um, make every asset count or what we've done in COVID, for instance, turning off certain assets, parking aircraft in the desert, how to plan and manage all that is a really, really big um, 
a big uh, undertaking. So we use a lot of um, technologies in order to help us do that. But the examples that I can see uh, or the parallels within cities, for instance, um, look at the whole, I think there's a mega trend going towards really last minute and I want what I want when I want it and order something on my phone and have it delivered. So the whole food delivery logistics it's kind of close to me because I used to work in LSG and catering for Lufthansa and uh, we work with some of these companies. Um, they have such a big uh, necessity for demand forecasting, for instance. If you look at what is going to be ordered by whom, then you can put the delivery much more localized. Like companies like Gorillas, who have just been starting to do uh, basically pick up groceries from a local store and deliver it. This is not going, this is the business model now, but I don't think this is going to be the business model in the future. You're going to have this development of like ghost kitchens to produce food um, in different areas to make the delivery that much faster. You're maybe going to have uh, predictive uh, analytics or predictive forecasting um, to know what people are going to order in which parts of the city really to make it faster. Then you talked about things like automization, automation. There's already been tons of, um, I don't know, exciting proof of concepts all over the place. To, um, Domino's in the US has uh, like a roaming pizza truck with robotic arms in the back, which you you order your pizza on your app and then it like spreads the mozzarella and the pepperoni according to what you've ordered, cooks it and while the driver is driving. There's been, um, I think, I think it's a Estonian company. It's like a kind of robot which runs along the sidewalk and also delivering food and things like that. So we have a lot of this kind of experience as well of how to um, to anticipate what people are going to order and what people are going to want to pay for it. This is what we do in our regular airline tickets. We know when something gets put in the basket that uh, a passenger will potentially buy it or not buy it or at which price, but we're monitoring on the prices um, in case you don't haven't seen behind the curtain of the airline industry, the prices are moving all the time. If you look for a, a price for a certain city pair um, and you look a couple of days later or a few hours later, the price might have moved because they are constantly analyzing or not they actually we are constantly analyzing for a lot of different airlines what is the actual price point that uh, that a passenger is going to be willing to pay so that i think is something um when dynamic pricing comes into all of this last mile uh, delivery and logistics is going to be interesting and then you have the whole automation with regards to um drone deliveries coming in mobility through different types of um yeah, systems, different types of ground systems or air systems. Um, and I think that the, the mobility that's coming and the uh, delivery mechanisms that are coming, which are not really in place yet, is for us also interesting because we see a lot of parallels as well to what we're doing. Um, I think um, maybe to sum up, demand forecasting, efficiency, all of these kind of things, um, what they essentially do and what they what they can be applied for within cities is to make everything more efficient um, to make your city more sustainable to reduce waste to increase the utility to increase the value of all of your services infrastructure how you plan to roll out infrastructure and services um, because if your if your citizens are not using your your product services infrastructure or what have you then you do not have a sustainable outlook um if you have cool companies which are coming and doing these kind of future facing business models um and proofs of concept and people like it it has to also make money at the end of the day and if it doesn't they will disappear they will um they will not survive and I think if you're talking about future cities and you're painting the picture of really, you know, drones flying, dropping cargo, this Amazon blimp, which is, you know, shooting packages down, this may or may not all come and it may or may not all come um, in the very near future, but it all has to make money or else the whole thing won't work. So I think that's uh, the lessons from airlines that I can give over to you and the audience. 
Thank you very much, Erin. And yeah, as someone who works in the Living Lab, I agree. A good user experience and profitability are the main key drivers. Uh, my next question is going to be for Maynard. What are the key priorities for Cargo Partners upcoming year in relation to digitalization? I feel like this is something that really got pushed forward in this year, digitalization and optimization. Oh, yes, uh, for sure. Uh, like everybody here is for sure experiencing uh, in this way or the other. Also at Cargo Partner, we are doing lots and lots on this topic, uh, what we see uh is needed for sure uh we are completely overhauling our transport management system into the most modern one on the market uh, we are doing this as we speak being pilot countries already involved we will be also digitalizing or are in the middle of the process of digitalizing also sales activities of cargo partner staff and uh, for sure our biggest worry and then the plan and project uh, for next uh, short future is our extension to our completely full iLogistics Center Ljubljana, uh, which already has almost 30,000 pallets inside. We will extend with another 14,000 square and, uh, of course, give everything uh, to, the, to support the modern digitalized uh, automated systems from, from IT to, to, to machinery inside, talking AGVs, talking about, let's say, uh, the automatic uh, robot packing uh, machines or to even connect everything in, in, a, in a swarm logistic that is a completely new and future concept of of uh, mix of uh, let's say mostly robotic and persons in the warehouse seeing and communicating uh, real time and uh, doing their thing and then hence uh, optimizing customers solutions and being more effective and so on but yeah the keyword is digitalization and cargo partner is completely on it with the final goal to optimize customers supply chains and of course to save them some time and money yeah <laughs> perfect thank you very much nina digitalization however does not only stop on land mariana your company has quite some experience in collaborating with the aviation industry can you share some of those insights what is it like uh, Vienna Airport was actually the first company in Austria to implement pre-5G uh, campus network uh, by A1 and uh, with our uh, technology partner Nokia. Mm -hmm. um, the technologies of network slicing and small cells enabled them to uh, have a separate layer uh, for the um, uh, employees uh, divided from the passenger uh, 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 data services, because previously they had a lot of problems with this. And the, the airport uh, has some had some 24 million uh, passengers yearly, and we hope that this will continue uh, with the coming months, of course. Uh, and um, they needed uh, a reliable network, uh, secure network, and that they gained with uh, the campus network because the, this layer, a separate layer, is distinguishing between the employees' devices and passengers' devices. So. Um, the employees' devices, of course, have the priority uh, in this network. And additionally, they had now uh, gained the um, uh, triple uh, core redundancy on top of this. Um, this use case is just one of uh, more than 260 now from, from Nokia for, for, for private networks. For, they are cooperating with big companies from uh, automotive world, from BMW to Toyota to... Um, uh, other big companies, Siemens, for example, um, uh, and they are supporting also efficiency and resiliency in logistics sector. Um, us being a telco, we are not focused just on the network layer. We are cooperating also in a device uh, layer, in content layer, uh, speaking about uh, factories again. Um, where we are very active also is the services layer. So um, the apps and software that can uh, uh, companies can benefit from data they collect uh, and making it accountable information. Um, so, um, in this regard, uh, IT and OT typically being very um, um, divided worlds within the factories uh, industry. So, um, 
convergence of these two worlds brings uh, tremendous possibilities for digitalization uh, and uh, also complexity on the other side. So um, connecting the whole um, uh, uh, automation stack within the factories is very complex and expensive job. Um, uh, but it's a key part of uh, so-called digitalized factory. Uh, it's not just getting rid of the papers, it's also connecting this tech. It's also uh, getting um, real-time or near real-time metrics and uh, of course, uh, big data analytics, predictive and ma machine uh, learning uh, with uh, industrial internet of things. Uh, we can connect all the um, uh, devices within the factory, not just the uh, PLCs also, or other devices, cameras, routers, whatever, uh, to a single um, um, uh, uh, namespace uh, that can uh, publish the data there and uh, all the uh, stacks uh, from um, SCADA to uh, MASS to ERP to big data can connect and subscribe to this data um, uh, seamlessly. So um, we see this as a, a big shift towards the digitalization within the industry sector. Um, with our local partners, we are also um, trying to unlock um, added value. Uh, we can bring these companies with uh, also, uh, not, not just using internal data sources, or using also external data sources. Um, so uh, if I sum up now, you can see that we are not just uh, a telco, we are also a product house, European product house, I could say, um, combining all the knowledge within the group uh, that can support companies with uh, IoT solutions, with security solutions and network solutions. Thank you very much, Mariana. My next question is for Erin. Looking at the legislation and all around safety, I personally believe that cargo drones are going to be accepted a lot quicker and a lot sooner in comparison to passenger vehicles. In your opinion, uh, how can we really connect the ecosystem on the ground and in the air and make the urban air cargo mobility a reality? Very good question. Um, this is a question that I have talked a lot to um, different um, customers of ours, different uh, UAM operators. A lot of the UA op, uh, UAM uh, urban air mobility operators um, and also drone cargo operators are really um, pushing the boundaries with this. And the, they, the general framework of regulatory supporting of understanding seems to be lagging behind, but in fact, it's not really. If you look at um, different uh, proofs of concept, which are really up and running already, like Wing in the US is doing, uh, this is a daughter company of Google, and they're doing um, delivery of Girl Guide cookies uh, to different areas. And they're already uh, really tracking and proving these, um, these delivery methodologies. Nobody is starting in congested urban areas. I think it's important to understand that this industry, um, whether it's passenger uh, taxis, air taxis, or whether it's cargo, or whether it's um, the fantastic um, proof of concept that Volocopter had just done with um, ADAC, which is like the German um, roadside assistance company to, to deliver uh, mechanics to the areas where they need to repair cars. Um, all of these things are not being done in these super high congested areas. If you look at cities and what they're able to manage, they say that most of the um, uh, cargo operations and even the passenger drones that are coming, it will be to connect um, airports with downtown in a first phase. Um, and this is maybe high risk areas because you have to um, overfly um, uh, highly populated areas on the ground. So um, high rises with people inside, uh, neighborhoods with people inside, children, dogs, whatever. Um, you have the privacy issue that you need to um, uh, basically solve as well because there's drones going to be flying through corridors um, over cities. Um, and all of these things, 
will not come instantaneously. I think if you speak with more experts, the more you hear that this is an incremental learning. There's a lot of things that we don't know yet, but this will come. Um, the time frame is 10 years to be uh, to have quite a few of them in the sky. Uh, maybe 30 years to have. I, I don't want to say Jetsons. Uh, this uh, American show from the 60s that everybody knows with, you know, drones flying you to and from work, but the the numbers that i've heard of are for a, a relatively good sized city maybe 300 verti ports in the future for passengers and then for for drones um cargo drones could be different infrastructure could be the same infrastructure could be partially different or, or the same um we have touched on regulatory and and the connection between air and ground in a couple of different projects that we've done we're working on um, airspace management software, which is basically um, part of our regular aviation software package, uh, but we normally work for the, the, the sky above with all of the Boeings and Airbuses um, and the upper airspace. And now this is lower airspace and, and starting to be um, applied to more urban airspace. Um, and what we've learned here, you need all of the stakeholders um, to come together to develop this. You cannot have um, an idea in um, in a bubble and have it uh, be the same idea which uh, which fits into the needs of the other stakeholders. I think what cities can do in order to uh, normalize this industry and to really um, yeah, support this industry is to try and connect different stakeholders, different and and find the experts that you need. Um, don't let politics regulate where you put your um, your verti ports. Because what I said uh, before with regards to utility, if you're planning infrastructure, um, which is supposed to be good for the next ten to thirty years, if you look at infrastructure projects of the past, maybe non-air mobility infra infrastructure projects, um, if they are not properly planned and designed and in the right area and in the growth areas of the future, then they are not sustainable because you're going to build something fantastic. It's going to be in the wrong place and nobody will use it. So um, we've also uh, started on a project uh, with the city of Berlin uh, looking into how to plan um, the location of different uh, Bertie ports. And we're working on uh, different projects with different um, different customers as well to see if this translates also in ground infrastructure or in, you know, uh, virtual stops. Or uh, what we're doing is essentially taking the data that we have from the uh, upper airspace and it needs uh, enhancement. We don't yet have as an industry or I mean, this new industry, um, urban air mobility, urban cargo. Um, we don't yet have all of the sensors in place to have, you know, things whipping around. This all still needs to be built and it will take time. So I think the core message is this is coming. Um, it needs a lot of planning, needs a lot of um, new technologies like LIDAR, lasers and different sensors coming in, um, different types of GPS remote uh, IDs, all kinds of different things. Um, and it needs a, still a lot of standardization. It needs um, ground handling manuals and it needs um, maintenance concepts and it needs the whole logistic supply chain behind um, in order for this to get up and running. So if you want to understand marrying air and, and land, there's really um, a, a huge amount of data points that need to come in, but as well, the utility of the customers behind it, whether it's package customers or whether it's um, you know mobility customers or moving themselves, um, and cities have to connect all of the stakeholders and also test um, of if these things are working or not before they start investing um, in infrastructure or investing in projects. And this would be, I don't know, the way forward. I think. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, I can personally say that my vision of urban future definitely involves drone delivered cookies and robot made pizza. And yeah. if I get to have a briefcase that turns into a VTOL, even so much better. Uh, this is all the time that we have for today. Dear panelists, thank you so much for coming and having this discussion with me. 
Uh, and Petra, back to you. Thank you, Claudia, and all panelists for contributing to our second round table. Next up is our coffee break, and following the break will be an exciting panel about smart cars. Tune in to learn all about it. See you after the coffee break. Hello and welcome back to our City as a Lab Summit Mobility 2021. We hope you enjoyed the coffee break and now we are entering our third panel, which is all about smart cars. Hello, Daniel again. Please share with us some more things about this very interesting topic. Yes, so in this session, we will hear from companies discussing how data, artificial intelligence, can be used to create new experiences so that uh, driving will not be anymore from A to B, but we talk about experiences. For example, the uh, Slovenian leading insurance company, Triglau, they will talk how e-mobility and later on autonomous driving are creating a new needs for new financial insurance products. Then we will hear two automotive OEMs, BMW Group, their division called Urban X, how they will talk about beyond mobility, how cities play the role in creating new mobility together with other stakeholders, and Daimler Mercedes-Benz, they will talk about, you know, data infotainment calls for cybersecurity. So they will talk about this very important topic. And last but not the least, from LA, California, we will hear our speaker from Sony Pictures, who will say how content like video streaming in vehicles will be realized in near future. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. And after those keynotes, we will have a round table where speakers and panelists will share other thoughts and views. So we will thinking out of box. We are very excited. Thank you very much, Mr. Daniel. Okay, let's start with Zaborovalnica Triglau. Joining us is Mr. Jaka Clement, Director of Motor Vehicles Insurance Department. He is responsible for taking the greatest risk, developing new products and improving existing ones and developing the car insurance claims. He says that the biggest challenge for him is to adopt products for effective insurance protection of modern forms of mobility, such as electric vehicles, micro-mobility, semi-autonomous vehicles, car sharing, etc. We are excited to hear more. Mr. Clement, welcome. Zavrovalnica Triglau is the leading insurance company and the parent company of the Triglau Group providing a range of life and non-life insurance products and services in Slovenia. We place customers at the center of all of our activities, but at the same time, our development is driven by innovative trends and innovations, also in the field of modern mobility. To provide our clients with reliable solutions as soon as the next day, we support events such as City as a Lab Summit Mobility 2021, and thus co-create a safer future. At Zavrovalnica Triglau, we are always in step with the ever-increasing speed of modern mobility. While we draw our knowledge and experience from a long tradition of business, we always stay on top of the latest trends and innovations. This is reflected in both our digital way of doing business and flexible services, as well as in the many projects we are working on to co-create the urban future. One of our strongest accelerators in this area is Triglau Lab. A technology center and digital business training ground where we develop smart services to provide visitors with innovative experiences in the field of security. In the Triglau Lab digital center, it is possible to try out many simulators and experience many different situations. For example, the Drive Safe Driving Simulator allows visitors to test their driving skills and learn how to handle unpredictable situations. We pay special attention to traffic safety education. 
Therefore, we test dangerous situations in controlled conditions and so prevent them in a real environment. We also cooperate with Atmosferzi and other renowned Slovenian experts and we encourage drivers to retake their driving tests. In addition to such efforts, we have adopted an innovative approach to road safety in the areas where people live. With the project Together for Traffic Safety, we have set up digital speed displays in cooperation with experts in local communities to help reduce speeding near schools and kindergartens. We also shifted into a higher gear of safety with the new Drive app, which offers users new functionalities for even safer driving, such as analyzing and monitoring their driving habits with instant feedback on driving style. With our innovative products, we are constantly adapting to market requirements and the needs of the urban user. Therefore, in addition to cars, our vehicle insurance also covers all modern means of transport, as well as luggage and rehabilitation in the event of an accident. Micromobility insurance provides insurance for micro vehicles and insurance in the event of liability or accident of the participants, along with assistance and casco. We make sure you can accelerate on two wheels without worrying. With our motorcycle insurance that ensures policyholders remain safe from financial loss in the event of an accident. Our advanced digital solutions also include aerial acceleration and drone-based damage recording and assessment. On the verge of the era of self-driving cars, we have witnessed a number of systems for safer and more efficient parking. And a few years ago, we were involved in the insurance of the first autonomous vehicle in Slovenia and the introduction of a discount for vehicles equipped with safety and assistance systems. We are also keeping pace with acceleration of modern mobility internally, enabling our employees to use e-scooters and electric cars via car sharing for transport between different locations. At Zavrovalnica Triglo, we are not only in step with the speed of modern mobility, but also creating it ourselves. With our digital way of doing business, flexible insurance and innovative projects. This is how we keep all road users safe, co-create a vision for the future of the city and ensure that everything will be all right in the days and years to come. Zavarovalnica Triglo. Thank you all in Zavarovalnica Triglau. As we heard, the insurance company is working with startups to become a serious player in this data-driven economy. Next guest at our City as a Lab Summit is someone who is passionate about cities and technology. She makes relationship between Urban X, Mini and the BMW Group easier. Joining us is the director for Urban X Europe, Mrs. Sarah Shepard. Thanks for having me and thanks for the introduction, Petra. It's a pleasure to be here and introduce UrbanX, our accelerator for startups reimagining city life. What you can see here is downtown LA. The pandemic has revealed how fragile and globally interconnected cities are. Cities are unique environments for progress, prosperity and culture. But they have been under pressure for a long time and face challenges like need of mobility, lack of affordable housing or infrastructure complexity. And with that, they face threats as the evaluation of infrastructure and real estate if corporates would leave cities. For us, this is not a reason to abandon the city, rather to embrace it and take the opportunity to re-envision how we build and rebuild cities for people. The future of cities is not set in stone and it's not easy to predict, but the choices which are made now will shape it for the future. And we think a way to make this happen is spending on creative, motivated and innovative startups to support the public sector and to construct growing and resilient cities. We gathered urban insights from our work with startups, trends which have been actually out there for a while and have been implemented now very fast because of COVID-19. And now cities are already coming back to life and these trends are still out there. So let's have a closer look. The first trend we see is that with no social interactions indoors, 
cities reassign streets to outdoor dining activities. They actually exchange parking slots with outdoor restaurant spaces. Secondly, amidst the pandemic, public transit ridership is down. Aptopia has registered 59% decline in transit app usage. But the bike share ridership has increased significantly. Many cities have considered supporting this trend like Paris. The city adds 650 kilometers, kilometers of bike routes. So they actually change car lanes to bike lanes. Third, you know, from electronics to cars to furniture, industries across the board are moving to on-demand models where a subscription guarantees that items land at our doorstep within an hour. For common goods delivered daily or weekly, the logistics may not be sustainable. And Amazon started to deliver with a fleet of 250 cargo bikes in New York City. DHL and UPS are actually testing similar systems. Fourth, there's this topic of green recovery. So within the pandemic, um, it was drawn attention to the intersection between public health, climate, and equity. As cities shape their recovery, many are positioning it in the context of climate change. Protecting the environment, our health and communities go hand in hand. And at the same time, the personal consumption and our personal travel habits are changing too. Last but not least, we have the shift to digital communities. And this conference is a perfect example because you're all kind of watching it online. And it also shifted from a physical to a digital space. And for example, Facebook data showed last March in 2020, the time spent in group calls increased by a thousand percent. But all of these megatrends are not isolated. They're deeply connected and interdependent. And cities are local points of these trends. And we conceive cities as ecosystems. And we like to understand the city as a platform. Technology is informing cities from siloed organizations to deeply connected ecosystems where new solutions need to be integrated. Big infrastructure and top-down planning are important aspects of every functional city, but we not, don't stop there. We understand what exists in the city as an opportunity to build up on, to amplify with new technologies and to enrich with relevant services. And now I would actually like to answer a question which maybe already popped up during my presentation. Why are cities a relevant topic for a car company like Mini? The original Mini was born in 1959. The designer, Sir Alec Isigaunas, turned the oil crisis into an opportunity to develop a small, innovative and efficient car. Mini challenged the status quo at that time and our passion for finding solutions for society scale challenges is what drives Urban X and Mini today. And we still want to like to, we actually still want to turn crisis into opportunities. We think that all of these great ideas will not happen in isolation. They need exchange. And this is why we like to support and work with entrepreneurs, kind of the heroes of our time. We have found a methodology for running accelerator programs. First, we need to group up to rethink cities. And now is the time to do so. We use technology and design to drive change across many urban sectors. And entrepreneurs are ideal positioned to test and grow new solutions. We can support them through tools and our network. Our startups are creating disruptive and scalable solutions across sectors like built environment and real estate, food waste, water, public health and safety, energy, transportation, and more. They are aiming to make cities more sustainable for the future. We see the cities as a whole, and to succeed in one sector, you also have to look at the other ones. And all of that is translated into the following program setup. We are based in New York. We get every six months up to 500 applications for six to seven or eight <laughs> slots per cohort. And the startups who work with us do that for five months. Our partner, a, venture, a US venture fund, Urban Us, invests 100K per company. And during the program, we match the startups with world-class engineers and design talent to help them turn the idea into a product for the real life or the real world. And with each and every cohort, our global community of entrepreneurs and innovators grows. I brought three startups with me to give you a glimpse of our portfolio. 
What you can see here is One Roof. One Roof is a company which is now a current cohort. And they create a communication platform that helps people living in the same building to form a community and become more resourceful, to make people feel more connected, supported, and less lonely. The next one is Nearspace Labs. They are focused on urban imagery. It's balloon-based, so it's kind of carbon-free, and they cover the sphere in between drones and satellites. It's quite useful for cities when they are looking for activities in ports or regions for malls. Last but not least, I have brought Robotics. It's a company which is, yeah, a little bit longer with us, and all of us know the problems with the potholes and streets. Robotics created an AI technology to make it easier to identify them and fix them with less money and a shorter amount of time. With UrbanX, we want to aim to we aim to empower entrepreneurs and offer them a global platform to exchange. The program is extremely hands-on, and to date, we have invested in 66 companies, all in an effort to make our cities more resilient and looming climate crisis. Over the last five years, we have gathered a wealth of insights into urban problems, built connections with urban leaders worldwide. And we're bringing together startups from Texas to Tel Aviv. We are able to incubate ideas in cities. And these capabilities have made us to a number one accelerator in urban tech. So I would actually invite you to apply, to cooperate with us, or to share ideas with us. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And now back to Claudia. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your presentation. Next up, please join us for the Innovation in Smart Cars Fireside Chat with Mercedes-Benz Tel Aviv. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Innovation in Smart Cars Fireside Chat with Mercedes-Benz Tel Aviv. Vehicles are no longer perceived as just means of transportation. They are becoming smart and connected to the ecosystem thus creating a huge mass of data. Joining me today to discuss this topic further is Mr. Guy Harpak, security and technology expert at Mercedes-Benz Tel Aviv. Thank you very much for joining me, Mr. Harpak. Thank you, Claudia. It's great to be here and thank you for the opportunity. You're more than welcome. We see a growing discussion around smart car concepts, connected, autonomous, shared and electric, how do you see uh, the trends in your day-to-day -day work in Tel Aviv? So that's a great uh, question. Uh, obviously, these trends affect the day-to-day -day work. They're also um, one of the reasons why we have an R&D site here in Tel Aviv. Um, I would say that uh, I'm a technology person, uh, so I look uh, at how the trends affect my day-to-day -day work, but also how they affect the general uh, technology ecosystem. As a technology person, I'm also more, you know, a lean bias towards looking at only the technology, but, but I think that the main thing that we need to look at, or at least the first thing that we need to look at, is how we see more and more value being delivered to the customers uh, with uh, using software uh, in the car, in the cloud, in IoT devices, or smartphones connected to the cars. Uh, so uh, this first impact of more value delivered with software attracts new talents to the, to the industry, new software engineers, uh, software product managers, kind of affecting the way the industry uh, works. And, and this is exciting uh, as a person coming from tech uh, to look at, say, at, uh, at the automotive industry. Uh, this usage of uh, software and of the new technologies unlocks new customer value uh, allowing us basically the customers and, uh, and, and us as an OEM uh, to offer uh, ways to, uh, I would say, utilize the time spent in the car more, uh, better for, for the, all of the passengers in the car, the drivers and the other passengers. Um, you can imagine yourself uh, how you could do that. Uh, this, this starts with the productivity tools for the work, uh, goes through entertainment, and up to uh, even things like, um, like health-based uh, offerings that can come in the car. So these trends that you describe are, are changing uh, the way we, we deliver uh, software. And I, and I see how the ecosystem is reacting. The ecosystem here in Tel Aviv, for example, 
is starting to uh, to offer new solutions. This is uh, our uh, our innovation is formed. Second, uh, second impact behind how we how, uh, beyond how we deliver value uh, is that you see more uh, variety in the automotive industry. So uh, it's nice to look at the electric vehicles, and it's very exciting to look how electric vehicles are being built. It's a new technology of how you drive a car, uh, but but you can also see that it's pushing not only the car but also the society. How basically how human beings use energy, how human beings treat energy how human beings treat uh, new energy sources. So uh, I look at the, personally, I look at the automotive industry as something that has a lot of impact on society in general and how, how we use technology. Um, and I see a value uh, coming um, uh, when, when this drives the ecosystem, in the ecosystem. So I see uh, new companies that offer new technologies, but I also see uh, amazing value here in Tel Aviv with companies that do what I call um, take ideas from other industries and other concepts and utilize them in this new automotive industry. So the trends that you're describing is allowing for new uh, concepts from other industries to come into uh, the automotive industry and, and basically uh, create new areas of technology. For example, you see radars that used to be radars that are used, for example, in the aerospace industry and existed for, for, for maybe even decades. But now they are being used in cars in order to uh, uh, detect pedestrians jumping in the road and you know, prevent the next uh, car accident. So uh, these are um, very interesting concepts uh, where you see uh, new industries uh, transition into the automotive industry. And third, and maybe most important, where I look here at, uh, you asked about the day-to-day -day, uh, work here in Tel Aviv, and I look at the local uh, R&D side. So I see that we have young talents here. We have young people that are joining uh, uh, more than a hundred years old uh, company. So you see how the, 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 um, the new ways of operating and the new ways of the new technologies, but the, also the new ways of delivering the value that I mentioned is attracting the next generation of, of innovators. So I think that these trends shape the industry, shape how we deliver value, shape the technology, but also uh, have impact on the, all of the ecosystem. Very great insight, Mr. Harpak. And as we were talking about trends, do you think that the growing trends in the industry offer a chance for any other technological collaborations as well? Um, well, first of all, I think when you look at, uh, at uh, how I analyzed the first uh, question, so obviously, yes, because uh, we see um, new technologies coming, for example, from other industries. Now we have the chance for collaboration in the automotive industry. But I would say that there was always a responsible collaboration in the automotive industry, at least when I look at the great uh, OEMs. Collaboration was always there. But today what I see is an interesting trend where startups that I used to know uh, personally uh, from the ecosystem are starting to offer automotive centered uh, use cases or products. So uh, you see that in the cybersecurity space, for example, um, they used to be cybersecurity for IoT, but now any company that had a cybersecurity offering for IoT would offer uh, a, a use case of our solution for, uh, for automotive. Um, you see that in, uh, in entertainment or in, uh, or in other gaming industries, for example, that now they see a chance to utilize the games, casual games, also for the passenger in the rear seat. So this is, this is uh, another uh, aspect of collaboration that I can see uh, day to day. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the startups that I meet uh, show me um, examples of how they, they integrated their solution with, uh, with other leading OEMs. Um, and this is a live example of the fact that we have more collaborations because I, I worked in the startup ecosystem here for many years and I didn't see any OEM uh, you know, in the horizon. But now every second startup I meet uh, as an example of an actual work he did with an OEM. So um, 
to answer your question, yes, I see more chances of collaboration. I see that in practice, and and I see and I see more and and uh, more opportunities, and also a lot of openness uh, from how we operate because we actively look for this open innovation, and uh, and as we can see, we also actively find it. Short answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you for the longer explanation. Uh, innovation is definitely the fuel of the future, so I am very excited and happy to hear that OEMs are uh, connecting and working with startups more and more. Previously, you've mentioned that a lot of young talent is coming to Tel Aviv. Could you maybe elaborate a bit further? Uh, why is Israel such a good spot to drive innovation further and faster? Well, first of all, I'll say uh, Israel is a member of uh, many other countries that are good spots to drive, uh, to drive innovation uh, further. So I think Israel is a good example. Uh, it's one example. Um, I, I live here and I, and, I, and I think about your question a lot. I mean, uh, what are the key enablers and what are the key principles that, that helped create this, uh, this buzzing ecosystem here in Tel Aviv and Israel in general? Um, usually I analyze it from two different perspectives. Uh, first is the environment and second is the inv individual. So the environment in large uh, in Israel is culturally leaning towards um, innovation. That means that when you grow up, uh, you always look at the, at the technological uh, education as something very important uh, that also uh, can't come alone. It also needs to come with general, uh, general um, education. And this pushes you uh, to see, this creates the curiosity that allows you to see the, the opportunities for innovation. Um, when you're exposed to technology from a young age, uh, and, and I, I, I often ask this question when I need to interview new people, since when, when did you start coding? When you're exposed to technology from a young age, so, so you kind of start to think like the computer. It's not always good, but it has, a, it has good, uh, um, good, an upside when it comes to innovation. Uh, so you become intimate with the, with the technology, and that's important. Um, also, there is a buzzing, also from the environment perspective, I would say there is a buzzing uh, venture capital ecosystem here. So, uh, so if you want to do innovation in Tel Aviv, in Israel, then you usually have sources for money and a lot of people to learn from. The, the, the venture capital industry and also the other, the other uh, companies are also are very uh, collaborative in terms of helping each other uh, thrive. Uh, I think this ecosystem is a result of... Um, strong encouragement done using policy in the country uh, a few decades ago that led to success stories that led to a new capital flowing in. And uh, this capital is very uh, sophisticated in the sense that it helps the ecosystem thrive. So it, it's not only money, it's also uh, connections, finding talents, finding business opportunities. From the individual perspective, because these two perspectives are more environmental, uh, I would say that for the, that for the individual here, becoming an entrepreneur is like uh, if you would become a rock star in the 90s. So this is like the peak ambition uh, in the industry. And this is people's uh, inspiration. Uh, I, I know it from my own experience. Uh, I, I was there as an entrepreneur and, and it felt like you're in the top league uh, of your site, of course. Uh, the reality is that also working for uh, for companies uh, um, that are big corporates is also exciting and has a lot of room for it, for innovation. But culturally, we we uh, admire the entrepreneur, and maybe most important, um, mistakes are culturally acceptable here. I mean, you're encouraged to make mistakes. Uh, it's it's um, of course people would uh, would. It would be better if you can succeed, but if you try something and made a mistake that, that doesn't hurt anyone and manage to, to, to learn from it, then it's, it's perceived as a good thing. It's not perceived like you made mistakes and you should uh, uh, lower your uh, heads or your profile. And I think this allows for innovation because most innovation 
uh, is taking a chance of failure. And if you as an individual think that, you, that it's good, then you would try and do it. So the environment, the, the buzzing ecosystem, and the cultural that pushes people to do innovation. That sounds amazing. I can definitely personally say that I should most definitely visit Israel. And I really like the point where uh, making mistakes is seen as an opportunity to learn rather for something to put the person down. You know, mistakes are the best ways for us to grow and it's the best way to help innovation grow as well. Um, as you are the perfect person in this environment with your experiences, uh, I would like to ask one last question. What are the lessons learned about how to build a partner ecosystem and accelerate innovation as ecosystems are the key? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, first of all, um, always find a way to make the process easier. Um, if innovation starts with one person or, or a small group of people trying to do something new, then they have a lot in their heads. And they don't necessarily have neither the time nor the capital or not even the, the knowledge how to deal with bureaucracy, how to deal with, with processes, and how to do all of, all of the things in an orderly manner. So always find a way uh, to make things easier. Uh, because because innovation comes with uh, like like we said earlier trying to make mistakes so lower the the fear factor in doing innovation uh, second be open on your about your expectations uh, we here when we work with the ecosystem you know we are, we are a great uh, an international company um, we we have high expectations we only uh, do uh, best of class um, um, products and best of class. Uh, we, expe we expect companies that know how to behave in, in, in integrity and in a very ordered uh, manner. Uh, so we are open about this, uh, these expectations from the start and that, then the other, part, the other side can, can plan in advance and, and decide if they want to take this journey with, with, with us. And I think it's true for if you're a government or if you're a large uh, corporate and, may, and, and also if you're just a person. Be open about your uh, expectations. Allow um, for safe mistakes, uh, like we said earlier. Build this sandbox. Build a sandbox where people can see that they have the guardrails. When people know they can make mistakes and this will be appreciated, this will be, like you said, the chance for learning. And after you build the sandbox, let, let the flowers bloom. You know, Let the people come into the sandbox, play, and encourage them. Show them that that one day, if they you know if they build a good enough castle, then they can get out of the sandbox and and use it in the world. Um, and I think uh, last is put yourself out there. Put yourself out there. Um, uh, we all that there are many valuable brands. Then use your brand. Um, there are many. Uh, um, uh, assets that you have in order to encourage innovation, use these assets, but le also let the people know. So it's not just marketing, you know, it's not just uh, slogans uh, or, or cool ads. It's really putting yourself out there in the field, meeting with the people, arranging meetups, uh, letting, letting, letting the friction happen, uh, even let people play with the assets that you have um, without any commitment and without any uh, commitment on either side. Um, but allow them to feel that, that you're a partner for innovation. And I think that, that the people themselves will bring the innovation because, you know, in the end, all innovation is a spark in someone's mind that meets, you know, the, the fuel in order to light the fire. So put the fuel and let the sparks touch it. And then I think you, you, will, you will have innovation. There we go, four easy steps. Keep it simple, communicate your expectations, create a safe environment where mistakes are allowed, and get yourself out there, network. Perfect, who knew it would be so simple? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you again for spending time with us and helping us explore the urban future. It was my pleasure, Mr. Hartberg. Thank you very much, thank you for the opportunity. 
And I hope that uh, next time we will do it uh, not virtually. Yes, I hope the next time I will be able to fly there and meet all the innovations. Thank you. Dear guests, we are now moving away from car companies to something completely different. You might know the next company from Charlie's Angels or Spider-Man. Please give a huge welcome to Sony Pictures Entertainment. This American entertainment company is known for producing, acquiring and distributing filmed entertainment through multiple platforms. With the rise of the autonomous marketplace in car entertainment evolution and streaming are just two pieces of the in-vehicle experience puzzle. With us today is Mr. Joseph Perry, Director, New Media Distribution Automotive. Thank you, Petra, for that very generous introduction. And I thank you all for tuning in and listening to my segment today, which will focus on how Sony Pictures views the world of streaming content infotainment and the outlook of streaming content, content infotainment inside uh, the future of vehicles. Um, as we begin, and as I begin to discuss today, automakers, as well as the industry stakeholders, really face a lot of challenges effectively of how to deliver streaming content um, to consumers who are purchasing and engaging and essentially living with their vehicles. Um, existing OTT technology and services really have, lend, have limited or hindered the ability for consumers, um, as well as for manufacturers, to be able to deliver that streaming content for consumers to consume it. So today we're going to talk about some of those challenges and how we think about those solutions that not only will help to deliver and overcome some of those objectives, objectives, but will also be able to provide brand value for you as you bring out new innovative products in your automotive space. So before I dig too deep into how to address the product approach, I'd like to discuss some of the current landscape of the entertainment and streaming content business. So today, U.S. adults spend approximately three hours to four hours a day on devices streaming content. Now, of course, this has changed a lot in the past 12 months due to um, the world situation of the pandemic. However, it's still been on a trajectory to continue to grow and evolve. And we did expect to see that kind of growth um, of at least up to six hours in the most recent um, studies of people over the age of 16. In fact, according to Forbes magazine, in 2020 alone, streaming content doubled on average for users. We've seen a transformation for this from all kinds of players. So there's lots of content and future investing that's happening right now in the connected vehicles and electric vehicle space. So as we look back in recent history, uh, there's been lots of EVs and connected vehicles that have brought out types of service that allow consumers to engage in other types of infotainment inside their vehicle. In 2019 alone, there have been over 2 million electric vehicles just sold. And that's not just electric vehicles, that includes other vehicles that have connected platforms that allow consumers to engage in some of those different services that I just previously mentioned. The space in connected vehicles is expected to grow an additional 20% um, and reach ultimately over $1.2 trillion investment by the year 2030. So that's a lot of investment, a lot of attention going into that particular space, which we know is of interest to consumers as well as to the industry stakeholders. So by the end of the decade, um, we expect to see over $600 million um, on money spent in these in-car services from consumers. So those are the actual subscription dollars and the payment for services for those streaming content services. Um, some recent studies, Streaming Observer calculates that consumers um, are spending, as I mentioned, over three hours a day um, currently consuming that content through the streaming platform. So as we look at that and think about how that grows over time, that's a whole lot of time that consumers are actually engaging in that space, um, not only outside their vehicle, but inside their vehicle. So we know that there's opportunity there. And one of the things that we commonly get asked about is, well, what about Netflix? So Netflix is one of the more um, common known platforms that has streaming content. So if we look at Netflix specifically for consumers, we recognize that consumers are spending lots of hours and lots of time 
consuming that. In fact, on average, we're looking at probably 288 gigabytes per month alone on Netflix that we see across the industry. But one of the challenges that we also see with Netflix that I want to point out is the fact that Netflix is also challenged with being able to provide more current content. So as you'll probably have seen in recent times, Netflix has actually um, seen their content and new content acquisitions slow down because they're creating their own content. So it, it's more of a struggle now to get that premium content. So as we continue to evolve and as we engage with industry leaders and um, industry experts, um, there are a few constants that happen in these discussions. So first of all, everyone recognizes uh, the importance for content and streaming services. The other thing is that everyone also recognizes that there's a host of factors and hurdles that make it really difficult to move forward with bringing those streaming services into the vehicle. So the first thing is, how is it built? Uh, thinking about the, engin the engineering, the architecture, the technology, all the things that have to happen in order to be able to deliver the actual service. Then there comes the components of how to actually manage it. How do you manage the acquisition of that content, the publishing rights of that content? And then lastly, there's managing um, the cost for investing and bringing all those different services with having a smart return on investment for all the dollars that it costs to bring those items to market. So it's not easy. It's very difficult for everybody to move in that particular space. So we also know that the entertainment industry um, is always gonna be a natural spot for consumers as well as for the industry to focus some efforts into how to, advance, how to look at this particular space. Sony Pictures Entertainment, which is part of a very large technological organization, the Sony family, um, is in the right spot to address those type of concerns because of our close position with the entertainment industry as well as our close alliance with bringing um, leading technologies into the marketplace. As the industry is trying to figure out how to bring all these different services, there are a lot of things happening in the marketplace and a lot of things that um, are hard to get expertise on if you do not have that existing expertise, such as managing all the content rights, managing how to acquire that existing content, as well as creating the content, which is a place that Sony Pictures um, already plays directly intimately in. As we focus our efforts on the industry, on uh, stakeholders, um, we see the struggle of managing and prioritizing the consumer needs with what consumers also perceive as value. So in addition to growing those, those growing consumer expectations around safety, functionality, and features inside the vehicle, all of which are very costly, uh, we know that partners are also, and the industry is also very constrained on really developing, as I mentioned, that expertise to bring those type of, those streaming infotainment services into the vehicle. So we've come up with some solutions as well as some benefits that can help address some of these key pain points. So because our services developed with the industry, we recognize the importance of being able to be flexible with different platforms. So as I talk to many manufacturers, um, one of the biggest challenges that they have is that as they are bringing out new products and new platforms, they may have legacy platforms of some of their other older vehicles. So being able to manage that technical architecture where you can still provide the same experience to all the consumers, but in a way that you can bring those services to the, and account for the variances that you have within the platforms. We're consistently told um, that it's also very important to provide revenue opportunities, revenue generating opportunities. So our learnings have allowed us to create a service that not only could adapt to all those different changing technological environments, but also provide really a flexible model for viable commercial um, engagements with consumers that really can help manufacturers to generate that revenue opportunity that is so needed. And while talking to industry professionals, we've learned that manufacturers really want to differentiate their product from the others that are in the marketplace. So it's really important um, for OEMs not to just become an access point. So such as just having access for Netflix, but really being able to have immersive and experiences that are unique to those particular platforms and their products that they have. The cost for those integrations are high, and we feel like we've come up with a solution that will also help to mitigate those very escalating costs in terms of being able to provide that service. And lastly, I wanna just talk about that OEMs really want to have 
partners in this technology space that are viable. So Sony has been around for more than 70 years. And because of that longevity, uh, we're going to be here around for many more years than that to come. So we're able to support not only the existing um, instances of streaming technologies that are coming out immediately, but also those future um, generations of future formats, such as 4K, such as 8K, um, artificial reality, virtual reality, being able to bring all those different types of innovative services into the vehicle. So RideView, the service that we've created, is really um, our ultimate digital video solution for in car entertainment. So this is fully customizable for any OEM in order to be able to have not only your own white label products, but also be able to customize it to the experiences that you really want your consumers to engage in based on their usage and experience. So one of the key features of our RideView service is being able to provide um, access to consumers through the vehicle relationship to up to six screens at one time. So in addition to having potentially built-in rear seat entertainment screens in the back seat, consumers would also have the ability to engage with personal devices in the exact same service where everyone in the vehicle can be engaging and watching that service at the exact same time. So this is something we feel is very unique and is also going to be very valued by consumers to be able to have that immersive and really good family experience um, or experience of enjoying um, those different types of premium content while in your vehicle. The platform also allows for very easy integration for um, granting instant access to all types of premium content. So one of the things that's great about a partnership with Sony Pictures Entertainment and our studio is the fact that we're bringing you blockbuster co content on a regular basis. But in addition to that, being able to have access to existing and legacy and classical blockbuster content is also be available um, with many different formats and all those different platforms that are also going to be prevalent in the different platforms that we're supporting. There's also a dedicated resource team to be able to support the ongoing support and optimizing the future formats, as I mentioned, as we go forward with really being able to deliver these first-in-class services. And as I really just mentioned and want to emphasize that this is a first-to-market digital video solution for the automotive infotainment space. So there's no current solution right now that's specifically designed um, to provide the automotive industry as well as vehicles this class leading service um, with the streaming content that can really allow the manufacturers to differentiate the product. So we know this is a first, in, a first to market um, offer that really is a great opportunity for the industry as well as um, industry stakeholders to be able to capitalize on the momentum that's happening and the opportunities based on the technology that has been enabled to create these services. The, other great benefit of the Ride View platform and working with Sony Pictures is it allows the industry and the OEM to be able to really fully own that consumer data experience. One of the things that we hear on a regular basis as I talk to manufacturers is the fact that being able to understand those consumer insights, what they're engaging in, the types of content they're looking at, um, at and where they're looking at that content really helps them to really not only improve the platform and the services that they're offering their consumers, but really also better understand their consumers and better define the consumers to develop future experiences and what's important to those consumers. And lastly, it allows um, those manufacturers to really leverage some of the great brands of Sony Pictures Entertainment, as well as our iconic characters such as Spider-Man, Venom, and Hotel, Hotel Transylvania. I'm sure everyone has their favorite um, brand or character, but all of those can be leveraged with a relationship um, through a studio like Sony Pictures. So, as we talk about closing, one of the things I just want to kind of summarize is that we've known digital for a long time. We've been in the digital space for a very long time, over 160 years combined across our different brands and companies. We know what's working, we know what isn't working, and we're able to prov provide and bring that expertise to manufacturers as you move into this space of really trying to figure out how do we capitalize and work on bringing these streaming content service into the market. So in closing, we really define four pillars for long-term success that I think are important for everyone. Um, and these elements look different for each OEM, but they're important in order to be able to really maximize the success. Thank you very much for your time today. 
Thank you for your time and interesting insight. And now it is time for the last roundtable of today. Joining us again is our moderator, Ms. Claudia Jans. Joining forces with our amazing speakers and guests, they will discuss why innovation is the new fuel and what new trends are shaping our new future. Ms. Jans, welcome. Hello everyone and welcome back to our next roundtable. The topic on this one is smart cars. Joining me are the following experts. Mr. Jaka Clement, Director of Motor Vehicle Insurance Department at Zaborvalnica of Triglav. Ms. Sara Schapa, Director of Urban X Europe by MINI. And of course, Neri Friedlander, Innovation and Partnership Manager at Daimler. Welcome everyone. Before I begin with my first question, I just want to lay down the rules. So everyone that's participating, please feel free to write in your questions in the chat. Preferably let us know who you want this question to be asked so we can include them at the end of our roundtable. Now, let's begin. My first question is for you, Yaka. As we've learned throughout all these presentations and keynotes, the car industry is rapidly evolving. It's getting smarter and hopefully safer as well. So Yaka, how are insurance companies affected by the fast developments of technical components in the automotive industry? Hey, thank you for your answer. So uh, with motor insurance policies, we provide cover for material damages as well as for body injuries. We provide insurance coverage for damages on insured objects as well as third party liability coverages. In either case, all of them are affected by ever faster technological advances in automotive industry. Basically, we can see two major trends in motor industry as it was already discussed today. One is electric vehicles and the other are vehicles equipped with advanced driver assistance systems, so-called ADAS. Second group will consequently become became autonomous vehicles in some time in future. For the time being, in insurance companies, we still analyze electric vehicles in detail and to them connected claims experience and properties. But uh, till now, there are simply not enough data to come to any statistically relevant conclusions. Based on the analysis we already have done in 2018, we identify contribution to greater road safety by vehicles equipped with safety assistance systems. We came to the conclusion that all such systems are designed to help to reduce the probability of car crash in the first place, therefore lowering the claim frequency on coverages that are related to driving. But at the same time, if crash do occur, claims on the material damages on such a vehicle are much higher. For instance, there are some coverages that are not related to driving itself, such as, let's say, parking coverage or hail coverage. If vehicle equipped with such system got hit by another unknown vehicle, let's say in case of parking coverage, systems can do nothing about it, but the claim on the material damage will be much higher in comparison to vehicle without any system. As a result of our analysis back in 2019, we introduced discount up till 15% for coverages directly related to driving, such as MTPL and motor own damage for, vehicle, for vehicles equipped with such system and no surcharge for now for coverages uh, that are not related to driving because we want to promote safer vehicles on our road. And if I might add my personal note here, as a driver of vehicle of second level of autonomy, I'm experiencing paying a bit less attention to the traffic because I subconsciously rely on these systems to keep me safe. And they did now for five years. Plus, much less plus when i arrive to the destination i am much less tired using this type of vehicle thank you very much for your answer yaka i agree i mean my dream was always to be for the car to drive me instead of me driving the car so i'm really excited for that to become reality uh my next question goes to sarah in the past Hardware was a hot topic, you know, everyone was talking about that. Meanwhile, today, everyone is talking about data. 
where do you think that the urban access focus will be in the next year? Hardware, data, something else? I would say there is not a focus on either or. Um, in our perspective, hardware and software actually um, go hand in hand. And um, when you think about the need um, for more resilient or connected um, infrastructure, um, the cities need both. They need advanced hardware and they need software, which make um, data more actionable or actually can improve city life for our customers, government stakeholders or citizens. And um, thinking about our 65 portfolio companies, the 80% who really um, gain follow on funding are also a balance of both advanced and connected hardware and uh, pure play software. And yeah, for our actually focus in the future, I would say we are continuing to focus on e-mobility, um, the connection to energy grid, um, making housing and business more efficient and resilient, um, and of course, um, taking the opportunity also to reduce carbon um, via logistics and solar supply chain. It's a supply chain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I love that. You know, sustainability and being eco-friendly is always something that I personally aim to as well. Uh, next question for Neri. We see that incumbents are working more and more with startup companies, you know, really getting connected, getting that fresh view. Um, according to your opinion, what are some of the best practices and lessons learned when it comes to forming these partnerships, you know, really mixing the ecosystems? Thank you, Claudia, for the question. And uh, first of all, you, you're totally right. We, in the last years, we see a lot of work and engagement with the ecosystems and with startups. I think it's mainly because uh, the, the DNA of OEMs was not focusing on certain uh, topics in the, um, that right now startups are able to penetrate and be part of what we call the auto tech industry, especially on the software side, on the sensor fusion side and the electrification as well. And so we see a lot, a lot of engagement going on, and I believe it's going to grow also in the future much more. And in order to create these kind of uh, partnerships or to form a successful partnership, which goes into an investment or a supplier uh, relationship with a startup, we usually do some kind of a background work. Uh, first of all, together with the colleagues in Daimler, um, we try to analyze and find the gaps in order to understand exactly what kind of problems we should tackle. And at the same time, we are looking also for the, um, I would say, less obstacles as possible. Uh, and we have certain fields where we have more opportunity for innovation rather than others. So we usually trying to focus on those that we can actually show more value. Uh, at the same time, we usually work with a sponsor or someone from the organization that wants to work with a startup, is, has the willingness to work with, the, with a new technology. So these things are uh, important for us in order to establish some kind of a partnership. And from the startup side, I would say, um, first of all, it's, the most important is the maturity of the startup. Uh, so we work with other ecosystem players, such as VCs and advisors, in order to identify when the startup is ready to work with a giant, uh, such as Daimler or any other OEM, mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's usually quite difficult. So we, we usually go towards uh, companies in round uh, B and above, uh, I would say, but not always. Sometimes we go also below. It usually depends how the startup it is and which uh, field. And at the same time, we want to make sure that the value proposition is very, very clear and, and it's easy to communicate that to the corporate. And the, for me, the most important thing is to build this trust between the startup and the corporate, between the department and the startup. Uh, usually what we do at the beginning is expectation management. We try to identify and define the goals and what should be uh, maybe what should might fail during the process and what we want to succeed with. And this is a key to create uh, the right uh, trust and eventually also the right output uh, with the startup and the corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that uh, answer, Mary. Maybe a sub question. What about when it comes to the culture between a incumbent and a startup? So the culture is, as you can understand, the culture is very, very different. You know, at Daimler we are approximately 300,000 employees. Most of the startups that we work with them are less than 100. And we have a more hierarchical culture. So it takes time until we manage to develop things internally. What we usually do